What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the godless engineer, and typically I'm critically analyzing apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. But tonight, uh, we are chatting with uh, Dr. Richard Carrier uh, about a recent live stream that was put on on another channel where Dr. Kip Davis and uh, Dr. James McGrath were kind of criticizing a blog that he wrote. I mean, I have to admit that I was a little confused by about half of the interview. Um, but they almost uh, never discuss the article that they're supposed the whole video is supposed to be about. They, they almost never, I mean, even when they do discuss it, they don't discuss what's in it, right? Is, is astonishing <laughs> <laughs> to do that for what was it, two hours, hour and a half? It was a long time, it was an hour and a half, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which I've got a lot of clips pulled out that we're going to be discussing tonight, but um, uh, we may not get through all of it, but we will definitely try to. Uh, now, um, Dr. Carrier, do you want to tell everybody kind of, uh, you know, who you are, where to find you and all that kind of stuff? Uh, but I have the blog linked down below. And so that's, that's where y'all can find, uh, cool, Carrier's yeah. website as well. Yeah, obviously, uh, through that blog, that's my website, richardcarrier.info. You can find everything about me. Um, and the online classes I teach, if you want to take those, uh, my books, you want to buy those, uh, how to become a Patreon supporter, what the benefits are of doing that and so on. Um, so you can, yeah, you can find all that there. Um, for people who don't know, uh, I'm a PhD from Columbia university in ancient history, and I've published a lot, uh, on the subject of the origins of Christianity. And in particular lately, obviously, uh, the historicity of Jesus. And so that's, <clears throat> I think the, the trio that we're dealing with today is very much against the idea of doubting the historicity of Jesus. And so they, they wrote this, they did, or they did this video, um, I don't know if you, were you going to explain the original article or did you want me to do that? Oh, you can, you can go ahead and explain it. Yeah. Uh, so um, the, uh, I can't remember the title off the top of my head. Do you have it right in front of you perhaps? Oh, yep. I actually do. Uh, it was called, hold on. I was reading it. So I scrolled down. Things fall apart only when you check the main reason the historicity of Jesus continues to be believed. Yeah, and so this is a different article than others I've written. Um, usually I'm dealing with like the full array of evidence or the particular hostile opponents of the, the idea that there was no Jesus. <clears throat> but what I wanted to do is uh, I noticed I'd accumulated a lot of examples of uh, people who aren't really hostile to the idea of the historicity of Jesus, but um, nevertheless give a reason. Like someone will say, well, here's my reason. Uh, and I'm talking about scholars, not not random people on the internet, but like actual Jesus historians and things. Uh, and the the first of all, the arguments are always different, uh, which is suspicious. And then the other is they're always bad, <laughs> and they fall apart when you check. And that that's what happened to me when I did this study uh, over ten years ago. Um, that I was a historicist actually, and uh, and once once I started checking all the things that I was told and thought were true about the, history, the reasons we are believe in the historicity of Jesus. Every argument falls apart when you check it. Uh, and that doesn't happen for other historical figures. It only happens for Jesus. And so this last article was one where I picked out a few of this, not a comp comprehensive list of arguments. It's just, I picked out some examples of what I'm talking about uh, and of actual historians making these kinds of arguments. And, and they're ones that often, uh, there, I try to look for things that are different than the usual arguments that people run into. Um, but nonetheless, they're like the top arguments that these people will say, this is my top number one reason. And it's like, that's a weird reason to believe in the historicity of Jesus. But uh, the point being is like, when you check these things, they fall apart, which means nobody's checking, right? Like everybody's just relying on things they thought or were told or whatever. And they just want the argument to go away. They're not actually interested in researching whether the argument holds up. Right. Like they're, they're not looking into it. Uh, and so that was the that was the article and its gist. And of course, this really offended uh, James McGrath and, and Kip Davis and certainly potential theist. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it definitely uh, did. I know uh, I think in the first clip that we're going to be looking at tonight, um, which is uh, not one of the things that you earmarked, but it is something that I wanted to talk about. Uh, at first, because uh, I have some rather interesting side clips uh, also worked in uh, that will be extremely illuminating uh, for the topic. <laughs> nice. um, so uh, it, 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 it's kind of a quick thing. But um, it, <clears throat> in any case, uh, so um, I know at the very start of this, you were kind of wanting to talk about methodology uh, first off, kind of give a just 
I guess, a brief overview or, or a quick talk about that. Yeah. So <clears throat> this has been my kick for like the last, well, certainly last five years. Uh, I've been more interested in rather than just debunking or answering arguments, right? Rather than just arguing a point. Um, what I would got more and more interested in is why do people keep holding irrational and poorly argued positions? Like what, and how do they do it? Right. So I'm more interested because I started to see common methodology. So like, uh, QAnon people and flat earthers and lizard people, people and, um, Christian fundamentalists and atheists who maintain historicity and things like that. Uh, and also, you know, people with, uh, you know, atheist conservatives, politically uh, and things like that. They all use a very similar toolbox of methods, uh, this sort of apologetic techniques of maintaining their position and critiquing positions they don't like. Uh, and it's the same toolbox across all these things. And I've noticed this. And so I've more and more I've been writing about when I debunk something, I try to also focus on the methodology that the person is using that is actually leading them astray and that they keep reusing over and over again. Uh, and that other people's use, and you start to see it everywhere, uh, these methodologies. It's not just the one person using this one weird method. No, it's everybody who has a false belief is using weird methods and kind of the same methods to defend that false belief. And <clears throat> a good example is quote mining. Uh, everybody knows this from creationists, right? They'll pick a quote out of context and then make an argument. Uh, and you have to know that that's dishonest. Like the person who's doing that knows they're taking it out of context, right? They know they're distorting the truth. Uh, and so you have to wonder, like, why do they do that? Like, why, why even bother a, di dishonestly defending your own belief? Like, can't you just defend it honestly? Like, why, why would you? Why would it, the fact that you have to lie about it? Why wouldn't that, in and of itself, convince you that you're wrong? <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's, there's this sort of delusionality of people that that's they're 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 comfortable with that. Uh, quote mining is a classic example. We might see some examples. Of, there there were examples in that video. I don't know if we'll bring any up, but we'll find out. Um, another is inserting suppositions into the text. And, and people deal with this with uh, apologists all the time, right? Where they're interpreting the Bible in some weird ass way that suits their particular religion and their particular sect, their particular subsect, right? So they, they're reading into the text things that aren't there and getting out of the text things that aren't there as a result. So it's kind of like a circular argument. Um, they do that in this video. So again, I don't know if we'll bring up specific examples, but if we see them, I'll point them out. Uh, and that they do that a lot, not just with the Bible. I mean, they do that with everything. So like when they read supposedly my book or my article, they read things into it that aren't there and then come out with it having said something else than it did. And they do this a lot. And that's the exact same thing that Christians do with the Bible to try and twist what the Bible means, get, get it to mean things that it doesn't say. Um, <clears throat> another is changing the subject. This is one that I've noticed. I'm starting to notice a lot lately. Um, where a particular point is getting uncomfortable because the argument is looking bad uh, from their perspective. Um, and so their solution is rather than follow it through to the conclusion and changing their mind, they change the subject uh, to something else. They complain about something else and then everybody forgets what they're originally talking about and they keep going. Um, that happens a lot. I don't, I don't know if many people in the audience have dealt with Christian apologists who do this a lot. Uh, they do it with political people with Political ideology is different from your own. They do it a lot. Uh, they come up with some complaint that can derail the conversation to be about something else to avoid the original thing that we were talking about. Because once you start getting into evidence and logic about that particular point, things go badly for them. And so they want to get away from it. And so this is a particular kind of evasion behavior that is very telltale uh, of people who really aren't interested in finding out the truth here. They have other agendas and other motivations. People who really want to know the truth want to dig down. They want to like get into things. They don't want to avoid. They don't want to change a subject. They want to keep it on track because they want to keep following it. They want to know where it goes. Uh, and there's a difference between styles that tells you a lot about where the person is coming from motivationally. And that tells you a lot about why they're so resistant and immune to evidence and reason. Um, <clears throat> there's also ignoring arguments. Uh, that happens a lot. Uh, and it's very common to, and this has actually been scientifically shown, that if you present let's say five arguments for a conclusion, uh, what a person will do is they'll pick the easiest one to refute. They'll forget the other four. They don't exist. They'll pick the easiest one to refute and come up with some refutation for it. And then they will conclude that they've, they've refuted the position. They've forgotten that there were four other arguments that were much better arguments with better evidence. Um, that happens a lot. Kip Davis does this a lot, maybe not in this video, but I, I've caught him doing it a lot. Uh, and so that's a, that's a thing to look out for is like, why are you doing that? 
why are you straw manning? Because that's a form of straw manning, right? You're picking one, the weakest thing and attacking that and ignoring all the strong arguments. Just ignore them. Like you're not even going to address them or talk about them. Why do that? Uh, this is a question you have to ask. Like, why would someone do that? Uh, and they do it. So they have a reason. Uh, you just have to work out what it is. Uh, and another is what I call false light. So this is a legal term. Um, in American law, there is like defamation where you say something false about someone that disparages their character. Uh, but there's also a, a doctrine called false light where you say something that isn't strictly false in the sense that like it, you could say like you can interpret it as in a certain way as being maybe true, but it's it gives the wrong impression deliberately. And so it, it puts something under a false light. Uh, and, and in American law, you can actually sue for defamation for false light because people can say, well, if you take what I said literally, it's true. It's like, yeah, but the way you phrased it, you were implying and therefore communicating a different thing than that. Uh, and so you're you're creating a false light situation. Uh, I find that happens a lot in apologetics, whether it's political apologetics, secular apologetics, Christian apologetics, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I wanted to bring those point out, like general methodologies that run into things. And I, I might call back to this little brief as we go along, as I, as I find examples of it. I know we're not going to go through the entire video, so we're not going to hit everything. So, but we'll, we'll see what comes up. Uh, but I just want people to be aware, like go looking for the methodologies. What is, how are people coming to these things? What are they doing? Like, don't be misled when they do things like changing the subject. Like, you need to call that out. Like, well, hold on. I just saw them change the subject. Why did they do that? Uh, rather than just being coasting along and having them lead you along uh, by the nose, essentially. Uh, I, I just want people to be aware of these methodologies. They are used everywhere by everyone uh, who has a false belief that they want to defend. Uh, and so when it comes up here, if it does, we'll see. Um, uh, I'll point it out. Awesome. Yeah. And I mean, uh, <clears throat> a lot of those things I've, I've noticed myself, like I, I haven't put down like a list uh, or anything like that, but I, I'm glad that you listed them out. Uh, Cause you know, the, <laughs> those things definitely are uh, in the videos tonight. Um, so uh, for, <laughs> first off um, we're starting kind of at the beginning of the video <coughs> and it's um, I've, I've kind of titled uh, my little segment on this is NT studies issues. Uh, so there was at the very beginning, there was a lot of discussion on like New Testament studies, the problems that uh, plague New Testament studies and what I, what your position and they collectively group all mythos together, uh, which uh, so I could say our position is about New Testament studies. So I've got some very poignant uh, or some very pointed uh, clips worked in here. Um, but also I've got at least one quote that I'm also going to bring up, uh, from Hector Avalos. So, uh, if you're ready, uh, there, Rick, we can, uh, go on ahead and, and go to the video. Blog on the second group that he talks about of scholars who don't check their sources apparently, but he also references in the introduction that a lot of scholars that are Christians affirm the history of the city of Jesus simply because they're Christians and, and seems to be like, the insinuation is that you can't trust Christian scholars. And I've seen Godless Engineer, who's one of his disciples, say this constantly. And you can't trust Christian scholars. They sign statements of faith and all those sorts, sorts of things. But I, what I find interesting about that is you have Richard Carrier, who's this anti-theistic counter-apologist who argues against the Christian faith. And supposedly he's not biased, but these Christian scholars are biased and, and you can't trust them. And so uh, you mentioned. OK, so <laughs> I know I'm, I'm stopping this a little quick. Oh, you're muted there, Rick. He immediately conflated. Um... By just any bias uh, with a faith dogma you cannot abandon. Like these are not the same thing. So everybody's biased. That's the point of objective methodologies is to allow you to make arguments that bypass your bias, right? Um, <clears throat> that's the whole point of methodology. Uh, but the, the thing that I said about Christians, um, yeah, that's a good, <laughs> well, that's another point as well is that as you see the people we can read on the screen, um, I, it doesn't affect my ideology whether Jesus existed or not. Like a historical Jesus is totally compatible with my worldview. Uh, and I used to, as an atheist, defend vehemently a historical Jesus. Uh, and I'm fine with that, right? Like I, so that that's not an existential threat to my ideology. But the non-existence of Jesus is an existential threat to uh, all, almost all modern Christianity. There, like you can come up with a logically possible version of Christianity that would be compatible with uh, the non-existent Jesus. And there've been a few fringe people who've tried to build that out. But in terms of popular Christianity, the Christianity that most people believe in, and I'm sure 
potential theist is an example. Uh, and definitely James McGrath is an example. Um, the non-existence of Jesus would entail their religion was false. And that means that they have to actually seriously entertain the possibility that their, their religion is false. And that's, that's too much of a threat. And so what I find is that generally you get a defensive reaction rather than a rational reaction. So that the moment you question the historicity of Jesus, it's all hands on deck. We have to defend the faith rather than, oh, that's an interesting possibility. What kind of evidence is there for that? So that's why it's not really possible to rely on Christian uh, scholars in this because they get so caught up in apologetics defending the faith that they can't actually objectively look at the evidence uh, on this particular thing because it's too much of a threat, like too much. Now, at the same time, I've simultaneously said that you cannot use this fact to argue against Christianity because the non-existence of Jesus is too uncertain. Like it's, I give it a fairly high percentage, probability like one in three that there was a historical Jesus. So that's a weak argument against history, against Christianity as a faith. You do much better granting historicity of Jesus and attacking resurrection apologetics, much more successful at that because then you're dealing with claims that are, have massively low probabilities. And so it's super easy to refute Christianity that way. Um, so these are not the related things. And I think that all of these things are being conflated here. Uh, bias versus existential threat versus uh, are, are we arguing against Christianity? I, I'm not. I think this is a stupid argument and useless argument against Christianity. Uh, so, so all of this is wrong. Uh, but this is another example where he's reading into the things I said that are not there and coming out with something I didn't say that actually contradicts things that I've, I have said multiple times in various other places. So that's a kind of like reading in bad faith. Like he, he wants this to have meant a certain thing. He got defensive, created a straw man of what I said, and then defended the faith, right? Like, oh, we're all objective and reliable, right? Like that was his whole, whole uh, attack there. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And it's funny that in attempting to critique the thing I'm talking about, he did the thing that I'm talking about. Uh, and so that, that just illustrates the point there. Um, good clip. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, um, uh, an, another thing is, is that in, I, I don't know if I got this in, in my clip, but I do remember McGrath saying that, uh, if Jesus had not physically existed, it wouldn't affect his faith at all. What do you think about that? <laughs> I, I, I doubt that. I actually seriously doubt it. Um, <clears throat> Because uh, without the historical existence of Jesus, there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, our faith is in vain, as Paul says, right? <clears throat> uh, so, so I'm seriously skeptical of that. And based on the things that McGrath writes, like you can go to his website and see the things that he defends there. He's definitely on the liberal side of Christian scholarship, right? So he's not like a fundamentalist by, by any means. Um, but I seriously doubt that he would happily switch to an ahistorical Jesus version of Christianity and still be a, a faithful Christian. Um, seems unlikely to me. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And I mean, I, I know that he definitely said that in the interview because he was very vehement about how pointless it is to like argue against the historicity of Jesus. And that was like one of the points that he made for somebody. Yeah. In the chat, and that's uh, an example yeah. of where he thinks that I'm arguing against like, this. It's an attack on Christianity, right? That's another conflation right. argument. Uh, I'm it, not actually have argued that you can't do that. Like this is not a good argument against Christianity, um, well, but he took it at that. He takes it that way. But the other thing is he flatly contradicts himself multiple times in this video. We'll, we'll probably get to examples where he's, he insists even swears on thing. And then half an hour later, he says exactly the opposite. Um, I've caught McGrath doing that a lot. You can go onto my blog and, and look up James McGrath in my search engine. Lots of articles where I document him doing this over and over again. It's, it's kind of his modus operandi. Yep. Uh, another quote that I wanted to share real quick for this, uh, first section here, like I said, is, uh, Dr. Avalos, which I accidentally stopped sharing instead of oh. sharing the appropriate <laughs> screen there. Uh, so it's, uh, this from Hector Avalos in the end of biblical studies, I got the Kindle locations. I don't have the physical book, but um, most biblical scholars in academia are still ministers or believers with specific denominational affiliations. Most religious studies programs in public institutions espouse a liberal or pluralistic approach to religion that frowns on criticism of religion as a whole. Even more resisted is the criticism of specific religious traditions. So 
the like this is uh, of course this is Hector Avalos um, who who wrote this, but there are plenty of other studies done on the problems with New Testament studies that yeah, and I, I'd call out. attention to the late great Hector Avalos. Um, in the end of biblical studies, uh, unlike a lot of critiques of things like this, he has a whole section, probably like several chapters, on liberal Christian scholarship and what's wrong with it and why it is not a solution to conservative Christian scholarship. Uh, a lot of people just attack conservative Christian scholarship, forget that liberal stuff exists and, and, and they assume they've attacked Christianity. Avalos's book is actually one of the few that does a detailed uh, attack on liberal approaches to uh, interpreting the Bible or reinterpreting the Bible as he would say it. Um, so that's, I, I highly recommend that book. And, and, you know, obviously for people who don't know, Hector Avalos was a professor of biblical studies uh, uh, and, and wrote on all subjects, both Old Testament and new uh, early Christianity, as well as ancient Judaism. So um, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, and he, he himself came from an evangelical background. Um, so, uh, so he, he definitely knows what he's talking about. He's been there on the other side of the wall, as it were. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. So, um, that, uh, we still get a little bit more to go in this clip. So, um, we're, uh, we're getting to a, a fun part here in a minute. <laughs> this mythical Christ would, wouldn't shake your faith. And what I find interesting is you have progressive Christians that deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus. They deny the virgin birth. Why would, why would it be a problem to go a step further and deny that Jesus was a historical person? You know what I mean? So I, I, well, I want to stop real quick right here because this is the first time, and maybe I'm just ignorant, but this is the first time that I've heard that there's like a substantial, at least substantial enough to be mentioned, of, of Christians that deny the resurrect the bodily resurrection. What I would want to know is is potential theist. Why does he not say he's one of them? So th this is the kind of rhetoric that I, I see a lot. Uh, so William Lane Craig did this in a debate he had with uh, Eddie Tabosh. Where Eddie Tabosh goes in and, and it's, it's, is Christianity true, I think was the subject. And he goes in and he gives a whole discourse on how hell, the very doctrine of hell, has to be false and therefore Christianity is false. And William Lane Craig gets up there and does the whole thing about how, oh, we don't have to, Christians don't have to believe in hell. And, and, and that's it. That was his argument. And it's like, you're a liar. Like, you're not even defending your own faith. You believe in hell. Uh, and <laughs> that's it's the kind of thing like, it's like defend Christianity at all costs, even if we have to lie about what our own beliefs are. Um, and do this in this false light way where, where notice potential theist and William Lane Craig never said that they don't believe in hell uh, or the resurrection in this case. They said, oh, there are Christians who do it, right? And so, but why is that relevant? to your belief, right? Like if there are Christians who are okay with this, why aren't you one of them is the question, right? Uh, and the other thing is like um, liberal Christianity that deny, like what he means by deny the physical resurrection. Um, they don't actually, uh, they deny, they deny the traditional resurrection of the flesh model. They adopt a uh, uh, restoration of existence in another form, right? Um, and, and that actually, in my opinion, was the original Christian teaching. And, and so there's, there, it's not that liberals like deny that there was any resurrection. Uh, they deny the particular stories of it in the Bible. They, they say those are metaphors and allegories for the truth, like the real resurrection that, that we will experience in some fashion or another. Uh, and then there's like a very small segment of um, liberal scholars who actually are uh, just cultural Christians and don't don't buy into any idea of the afterlife or the resurrection. Um, but again, they're very small, very few of those people, and they still need Jesus to be real. That's why they still defend the existence of Jesus, because if Jesus didn't exist, then he can't have been inspired by God. And then the things he said can't be any more meaningful than what Buddha said or, or whatever, right? So, uh, and the only way to get Christianity out of the box as a distinctive religion that you should believe in is if there's a real guy that you're worshiping, right? Uh, and it is possible, like I said, it's logically possible to construct a Christianity where you're worshiping what you recognize as a fictional person. Um, it's just, that's not popular. And that is not what most Christians do. And, and those Christians aren't in this debate. Like a lot of them are probably saying, yeah, I probably... I'm probably on board with mythicism being plausible. They're not the ones defending the faith. They're not the ones on this video here. Uh, and so uh, that, that's the thing. It's like in the very act of trying to defend themselves, they're actually revealing the point that I made is correct. 
Yeah. Uh, and just to uh, be clear, uh, I believe potential theists confirmed that he's a non-theist. Um, it, it, oh, I didn't know that. I've, al I, I've always been confused about the potential theism title. Yeah, but, yeah. Because uh, because he's always seemed um, like a non-theist, I guess. But well, I just seems I, to, yeah, he seems to speak as though it's his community, uh, the believers. So I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I was just genuinely confused, uh, I guess, because of how I was brought up uh, on well, yeah. in Christianity, like this whole idea. Oh, yeah. The resurrection didn't happen or it, it wasn't like a historical thing like that. That's just never been like a, a normal thing around me or anything that I've seen. Right. Right. But, to be fair to them, like you, you grew up in a conservative religious tradition. And so I, I think they're yeah. trying to say that. They're trying to throw all evangelicals and all uh, all literalist Catholics under the bus. They're trying to throw like 90% of Christians under the bus and, and defend Christianity by retreating to the 10% of Christians uh, oh. right, that aren't aren't those people. Um, but th that's not who's here uh, on this video. So well, Kip yeah. Davis, we know, is an unbeliever, but he was raised in a conservative tradition. So he knows that what he's saying is false in quite a lot of Christian traditions. Yeah. Uh, and, um, so yeah, just wanted to clear that up real quick. Uh, but anyways, uh, we'll continue on with this because, uh, you know, of course Kip is, is going to talk here in a minute and, uh, it's just not going to bode well for him. I, I don't understand like this yeah. the poisoning of the well of well, they're Christians. So you yeah. can't trust them. He goes even a step further than that too. Uh, in what I've seen, you can't trust anyone, uh, within the field because we've all been trained um yeah. by by christian scholars as well even even jewish um scholars who, who work uh in second temple judaism uh, uh roman antiquity and um and the new testament have apparently been been trained by christians and have had their their minds poisoned towards affirming this idea through nothing more than simple loyalty to the guild which really is silly and i think what it what it does maybe as much as anything else is it betrays uh an astonishing lack of awareness and familiarity with with even how the guild works uh, you know those of us those of us within it i've often said those of us within biblical scholarship often will look at things that that um carrier and other mythicists say and claim about the field of biblical scholarship and go, like that just looks nothing like my experience working with other scholars Some so the <laughs> the question that i have after hearing that spiel right like this is just not something that Kip has experienced in his, uh, uh, in his <laughs> time in the field. Right. So I was like, well, what, what does represent his experience in the field as far as the trustworthiness of like biblical studies or new Testament studies? And I got a clip for that. Uh, it's a nice. little long where he tells a story. And so we're going to listen to the entire story it. of it. And, uh, this is, so just to put this in context here, this is Kip's, normal experience in biblical studies okay just keep that in mind somebody can sign a statement of faith and work at a at a school demanding one and still be a good scholar it's because i don't think people really understand how these things work and from my own experience i haven't had to do this very often but i had i i did work at uh, at a christian university where i did have to sign uh, a statement of faith and the first time I went to sign it, I sat down and I looked at it and it had like eight points. I don't remember what they were, um, so don't ask. But I, I remember looking at the eight points and I was like, well, this is okay and this is okay. Not this one, not this one. Eh, maybe this one, not this one. And at the bottom, it said, check that you agree to everything and sign it or uh, check those that you disagree with and uh, include a written statement about your disagreements. So this is what I did. And uh, this is like I one of the first courses I ever taught. So I, I was new at this. So I, I, uh, I, I typed out, you know, some stuff and I was ready to, to staple it onto, the, onto the, the contract and sign it and just send it in. And then I had a thought, I was like, I should run this by my department head. And so I went to go see my department head. I was like, hey, I'm signing my contract. I've got this thing. I'm not entirely sure what to do with it. Uh, so I've checked everything off here that, you know, I have issues with. I've attached my, my position paper. And he looks at me, he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I was I, I'm supposed to do this, aren't I? He says, no. He says, just sign it. Just sign it and shut up. Just <laughs> yes. He said, and this is what he told me. He says, he, it was something like, the fewer excuses we give admin to, to dig around into what we're doing here, the better. 
Uh, because this is a this is a, a Christian university with with powerful wealthy board members who have you know uh, kids who who take or grandkids who take classes and you know when word gets back to them about the uh, how badly all of us in the biblical studies department have sold out to the Enlightenment, oh you know there was always hell to pay and it was a headache. So I say that uh, just to to kind of point out that just because you sign a statement of faith and I did this several times, I didn't believe half of it and I have no doubt that I was not alone in this. <clears throat> I just say that. Seminaries and Bible colleges all across North America, there are guys who are like holding their nose and signing their name. And then you just teach and then you you publish. I published. So the very first article that I ever published after I had signed this statement of faith was all about uh, gender in the Hebrew Bible. Oh, boy. OK, <laughs> nobody cared. Nobody came after me. Nobody. Nobody said anything. So this idea that your publications are strictly controlled by your institution is nonsense. Most places are just happy that you're writing something and publishing it because that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, let me get this straight. Maybe ma this is how I understand it all over the country at seminaries and Bible colleges and all that you have professors who are signing their work agreements with statements of faith and they're, planning on not honoring that but in planning not honoring that um they they admit that if if anything gets back to the administration there's hell to pay so there's i mean this does not help kilp's <laughs> position in my, yeah. in my opinion. also this is a good example of false examples so he, he says well i wrote a paper on gender in the bible but he never established that it said anything that contradicted anything in the faith statement. He never said it's it, it did any that anyone noticed, right? That checked. Like, did a parent find out about the paper? Did it actually contradict some actual faith doctrine? Did they go to the administration? Um, <clears throat> right. And you know, one could also point out by his own admission, he's no longer working there. Um, so <laughs> One can wonder how long do you think he could have gone on and how 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 close to the third rail. Does he honestly think he could have gotten there before he would have been fired? Uh, you know, doing some obscure thing about gender in the in the Old Testament. I, I seriously doubt half the people that would be concerned would even understand what that was talking about. But he's also not even explained what it said that was even contrary to the doctrine of faith statement. So it's a false example. Like it doesn't establish anything. The other thing is we have tons of examples of it, this the third rail getting hit. Uh, you know, Mike Lacona. Uh, we could go, you know, down the list, even M. David Litwa, right? We could just go through the list of people who've gotten trashed because they touched the third rail. Um, so, yeah, yeah. What, what Kip's saying is complete nonsense. Now, there is truth in the sense that he is strawmanning uh, the position that I have taken, right? He's, as he does, he strawmans all the time. And so I've never said that historians could never say anything out of the line. Um, what I've said is like, there are certain things that are going too far. And if you are too public about them, there will be consequences. Those consequences may be getting fired. Uh, it's certainly at the school he's talking about uh, his, like he just, he just admitted that that would have happened. If enough people got annoyed by something that he said that contradicted a faith statement, he would get fired. Uh, that's literally what he said. If people read between the lines. Um, but also uh, there's other ways to punish people, right? So even someone who has tenure can get punished. You can you can punish them by fucking with them uh, politically. You can give them like you know, swamp them with committee assignments. You can uh, alter their office. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do to fuck with people. But also you can just fuck with them, right? So like just just you know microaggressions and harassment can wear people down, and people know this. This is why like when uh, Latastor and I both spoke with Philip Davies about this. Uh, now, when Philip Davies was alive, uh, like we kept this quiet because he wanted us to, is that he expressed all this to us, that he had these fears, that, that even he was retired, like there wasn't really any direct way to attack him, but you could attack his reputation. He could be vilified, he could be belittled, he could be ridiculed. And that's all the things that Ehrman did to me when I came out uh, as this, right? As, and so um, this is exactly what Philip, and Philip Davies saw this, he saw him, saw Ehrman doing it to me, and he saw, he had seen all this done to Thomas Thompson like decades ago. Uh, and so the field still remembers what happened to Thomas Thompson. And so the field still has this fear. 
And it, I, I always talk about the example of what's called the panopticon. You can look it up online. It's a, a <clears throat> philosophical concept. And the panopticon is a thing where it's an imagining a situation where you think everybody is watching you, even though they're not really most of the time. But just because you think they are, your behavior is you modify your behavior to conform to what you think might be the third rail. And so that it doesn't matter whether it, the perception is true. All that matters is that it is what you perceive. And so the same thing, I think, with Philip Davies, where there wasn't really any way anybody could have heard him. Uh, but I'm not going to just out and say that to him. Hey, you loser, you should just come out and you know say that you're, you're a doubter of historicity. Um, no, because I under, I sympathized. I understood with his situation. I was outside the guild in a way that they could never touch me. They can, you know, ridicule me and, and do all the shit that they, you know, slander me and all the shit that they do do. Um, but because I have my own fan base and I'm, I'm patron supported, I'm immune to that. Right. Like, and, and also because I have a thick skin and I can, I can, I'm good at fighting back. So, um, but most people I've spoken to a lot of people who don't want to do that. I remember this is unrelated to this topic, but I did a survey of articles many years ago on women in philosophy, uh, atheist women in philosophy in particular. And a lot of women at that time, several several took me up and I have their interviews on, on my blog, but a lot of them didn't want to. And the, the, re the reason they gave me was this, is they say, well, look, yeah, I'm an atheist, but I'm also a woman in philosophy. I take a ton of shit for being a woman in philosophy. You're asking me to go public about being an atheist as well. You're doubling the amount of shit that I have to take. It's like, I don't want to do that. I just want to do my own work. I want to be left alone. Right. So uh, so that it's not like that they're going to be fired for being an atheist or anything like that. It's just they're going to take shit for it. And that's a lot of emotional labor. They don't want to deal with it. And so a lot of people just don't want to deal with it. Uh, and that's the whole point of this kind of ridiculing and harassment and stuff like that is to make people not to want to have to deal with it. Uh, and so it's, it's social pressure in that sense. So that also exists, right? Uh, so there's all of this happens. And I think most of the fears that keep people quiet are not real. I think that if they came out, it would go much better for them than they thought, but they believe that it won't. And that's why a lot of people remain quiet. That's why Philip Davies remained quiet to his death. Uh, and so I know from the, and, and this is in the guild. So I fucking know how the guild works. I've been in it. I've seen it. That's why I don't want to be in it because it fucking sucks. Uh, and so that's why I'm not there, but I, I know how it works. And so um, the thing is, is that you get a snowball effect, however, that the more people who start coming out and the more prestigious they are who start coming out, the, then more people start feeling comfortable coming out. And you've seen that I've seen this happen since 2014. That's, that's why we're going to probably get to a clip about my list. The list has grown from six people to over 40. Now, why do you think that is? In some cases, it's people who already were uh, uh, doubters before I published uh, that I didn't know about. Um, but a lot of them are people who sort of came close to touching the third rail and did it safely. Like a lot of them will be like, well, you know, I'm still a historicist, but I think it should be taken seriously. It's actually possible there wasn't a Jesus, right? Uh, and so, you know, James Crossley is an example where he wrote the preface to Raphael Atastra's peer-reviewed book, Criticizing the Historicity of Jesus. Um, the book is Questioning the Historicity of Jesus. Um, that's that's essentially coming out as saying, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm gonna give this the premature of endorsement by a prestigious biblical scholar. Now, d would that have happened had I not published? I don't think so. Uh, would that have happened had, had Hector Avalos not come out and, and said, yeah, I actually think there's maybe a 50-50 chance Jesus existed. Uh, I don't know. Like, and even Philip Davies, who didn't come out, nevertheless scolded. He wrote a public article scolding scholars like Bart Ehrman for trying to ridicule uh, mythicists out of the field. I mean, Ehrman literally said, "You can't get hired if you're a mythicist." So th that's a veiled threat, right? Like, we all know what that means. Uh, and Philip Davies knew what it meant, and that's why he wrote a whole article to say, "No, no, you fucking stop that right now." Uh, and then there have been several others. Justin Meggett and various others have written articles explaining, like, "Look, you need to cool it." with this sort of veiled threat business and start taking mythicism seriously. And so there, and as that happens, you get a snowball effect. And now we've got over 40 people who are at least saying that this should, needs to be taken more seriously than it has been. Uh, that's how the guild works. Uh, and it, it is, it is more based on fear and prestige than on rational evidence-based reasoning, in my opinion. And I think that is largely because there's so much Christian money and power involved in this field. Like you don't get this with Hercules studies. There's no, there's no threat to losing your grants 
uh, or, or losing your fan base if you deny the historicity of Hercules, um, you're not going to get harassed for it, right? Like, that's kind of thing. So uh, you're not going to get ridiculed for it. But you deny the historicity of Jesus, you will, as we, people see how I get treated. How do you think that makes them feel about the, the effect of them coming out? Uh, you know, and then here they do in this same video, they do this over and over again. Like even we're going to get to McGrath later where he's, I don't know if you have the part where he swears that he's, uh, that he uh, um, agrees that the evidence for Jesus is weak or whatever. Uh, and then That's like next section, 40 minutes later, he's like, Oh, mythicism is like creationism, right? It's like, wait a minute. So you just, now you're saying that the evidence is as good as for evolution. You've just flipped a hundred percent, right? Uh, that kind of bullshit pisses me off because it's so fucking dishonest. It's like, pick a lane. Like, don't, you know, let's hear your true self. Let's not hear the facade that you put on to make yourself look good. And then half an hour later, you've, you've Mott and Bailey'd me and you've gone to, uh, oh, you're just a crazy creationist. Mythicism is creationism. Um, yeah, that, that, that is the kind of, that is the, how the guild acts. That's the guild. And that's kind of like what my article is about, where I, I show like, even like the sincere, nice people in the field who, who aren't threatening anybody over this and don't want anybody to be threatened over this, they still have these weird reasons for believing in historicity. And in this video, they will only mention a few of them. They hardly deal with my article at all. But even when they do touch on my article, they never once ever touch on the evidence in my article. Uh, and we might get some examples there where I'll be able to point this out. But um, where, where I take an example and I show the evidence of what happens when you check to prove that they're not checking. Now, when you find scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar doing this same thing over and over and over and over again, you have found a trend. You have now established what is the norm in the field. Uh, and that's what my article does. And it does it with evidence. Now, in this video, they completely ignore all the evidence and they just try to gainsay things that I said. But in doing so, they literally demonstrate my entire point because there's so many things in here in this video where they didn't check. And some of them are really doozers where the, the Kip Davis is going to have a real foot in the mouth, like big time, because he didn't check. He just acted like a Christian apologist, spewed off something with total confidence, like Donald Trump, blah, blah, blah. That's completely false and wildly wrong uh, and easily disproved. Why? Why would he do that? Like, what? if you don't know what you're talking about, don't make assertions in it. So why do that? Like, what is Kip Davis doing? Like, what is what is the point of that? So there's something psychological going on there. It's like, why is he doing that? And you need to ask why he keeps doing that. Like, why is this his modus operandi? What's going on there? Because he's he's an unbeliever. He's not defending the faith. So what what is he defending? And why is he de why is he doing it that way? Uh, anyway, we'll get to examples as we get later on. Yeah, uh, there's a little bit more in this section, so I'll just play it. If you got something to say, just let me know. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that was one of the things that really jumped out at me in this particular blog post that you wanted us to talk about was that you know, he provides this really wonderful example of the fact that he is either not capable of reasoning logically or is dishonest, right? He says that for somebody who is a person of faith to entertain the possibility that Jesus didn't exist, he said they must first admit their religion is false. And that's just bizarre, right? They must entertain the possibility. They must be open to the possibility that religion is false. You don't have to start by determining your religion is false, and only then can you accurately just, you know. And, you know, he is... You know, I mean, it's no different with the art of mythicist, right? His beliefs are reinforced yeah. by a community Pause that affirms. You know, I mean, Pause his genius there. is being affirmed by yeah. all of his family. McGrath sucks at logic. I've demonstrated this multiple times on my blog, so you can go check. It's a good example of that, right? So so he, he's mistaken the point, right? The, the issue is that it is not, if, if, if you're going to entertain the possibility that Jesus didn't e exist, you do have to entertain the possibility that your religion is false. But you can't get to Jesus didn't exist without admitting your religion is false, right? It's like, he doesn't understand the difference between those two positions. So the difference is in one of those situations, you're defending the faith and therefore we can't really count on your, your judgment, right? But in the other, well, you're, you're seriously looking at the evidence with a serious possibility that you will abandon your faith. Uh, and like, you don't see that happen very often, right? Um, we see people abandon their faith when they look at evidence. Uh, and so that does happen. Even scholars, Kip Davis, I assume, is an example where he, I assume he was a scholar at some point. He was still a Christian. Something, something finally s snapped for him. And he said, you know, actually checking the evidence that kills this for me. Um, so he was able to go to cross that Rubicon, right? But that's what you have to do. That's the only way 
you can get to a conclusion that Jesus didn't exist is you have to cross that Rubicon. And that is what is absolutely too terrifying for most Christians to do, except the ones who actually do leave. Uh, and, and, and certain, like I said, fringe, very rare liberal Christians who can somehow reconcile uh, the non-existence of Jesus with their faith, as Thomas Brody did. I mean, Thomas Brody was a Catholic, uh, and he was advocate for the non-existence of Jesus. He had some sort of weird allegorical way of reinterpreting it. Um, the Catholic Church shut him up. Literally, they retired him. It, they told him to retire and never publish. Uh, and and th that literally happened. In fact, I'm trying to get the rulings. Like, they were published, but they're published in this Vatican publication. It's almost impossible to get. Um, so I'm trying to get copies of it. But it, it literally happened where they, they actually did an inquest. And they said that the ruling was that you can no longer publish we don't trust you to publish on this subject anymore because we can't have our own people talking about the non-existence of Jesus, which is another perfect example. Uh, and that's, of course, that's not the guild. That's the Vatican. That's a whole different, that's a, that's the worst, worst guild you could ever work in. Um, <clears throat> but nonetheless, it, it exemplifies what we're talking about. But th that's the thing is it's the fear of approaching that rail that is going to put you in a defensive mode. And thus you're not going to be able to look at things objectively. And we have, I, not only do I say that that's the case, I have concrete examples of that happening. And so I, it's not just something where I'm just saying it's happening. It's like I see it happening. And so now I'm like pointing out, I'm explaining why uh, that happens. So, um, and of course, it's funny that, that you know, McGrath himself is going to do that several times in this video. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, he's in defensive mode now. So he's trying to defend uh, his rationality despite uh, the absence of it, really. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Of his fans, you know, and it's it's hard to uh, consider the possibility that one might be wrong in that, uh, you know, with that level of pandering that he received. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, part it's part and parcel of scholarship for those of us who at least try to do it honestly and do it well that we have to be open to the possibility that we're wrong. All right. So he goes on to say, "What what I like is that he was saying right there that um, that uh, basically you ha are incapable of." Uh, uh, entertaining the idea that you might be wrong because you get so much praise from everybody. At another point, <laughs> he claimed that if he if he turned mythicist, he could get a six figure book deal. Now, I did not know you were rolling in a six figure book deal there, uh, Doctor Carrier. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean maybe maybe if I sold out, I could do that. Like I I'm not sure. Um, but how, doesn't that actually argue for my position? Right. Like, so like, like if it's so easy to do that for me, to just make money clearly, then I'm not doing this for the money. Mm -hmm. Then I might be right. <laughs> like I'm so certain I'm right. I have such good evidence that I'm right, that I'm literally turning down six figure, uh, uh deals, uh, to maintain the truth. That's, that's the extent of my integrity is that intense. I'm not saying that's the case. That, that's his argument. It's a dumb argument. He sucks at logic. But that's anyway, that's what he just basically said. Um, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's remotely possible that if I decided to become a complete creepy liar, like most preachers and, and whatnot, uh, that I could I could make bank off of that, certainly, because um, that's what all religious people uh, with charisma, not all like with many religious people with charisma do is uh, con Christians out of money uh and we we've got countless examples you could go uh, check the internet news reels for countless examples of this uh we know that's the case but that doesn't have anything to do with whether jesus existed or not we should be talking about the evidence not all this bullshit uh this bullshit that they're talking about this is the example of changing the subject right so rather yeah. than talk about what my article is about they've picked some random thing and complained about it for like half an hour where are we now oh five minutes we're at five minutes Oh, well, right? so this is, well, this is five minutes of my clip. Right. Oh, it's, okay. It, it, it's farther into, it's, it's right. probably around the 20, 20, 25 they, minutes. They were doing it a while. I watched the whole video live or yeah, when it was mm -hmm. live. And so they did it for a while. Yeah. Total waste of time. Like, can we just talk about the evidence? Why are you comply? Are you picking on all these little things that you can find some sort of rhetoric to complain about? Like they're the easy marks that aren't really relevant to the, the point of the article, but no, that's, that's changing the subject. That's 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 where they're, they're avoiding talking about the actual subject. And even when they finally like force themselves to come around to talk about the actual thing, they will avoid the subject by avoiding the evidence that's in my article. But anyway, yeah, that's my comment on that. All right. We just got a little bit more of this. I can't remember what's right here at the end, but um, we'll listen to it.
goes on to say, one can only speculate on Bart Ehrman's reason. Stubbornness, ego, peer pressure, oh, uh, fearing oh, loss sound. of... Speculate on Bart Ehrman's reason. Stubbornness, ego, peer pressure, who at least try to do it honestly and do it well. No. Hold on, are you hearing sound there, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds oh, good. Yeah. My sound is gone. Oh, okay. No, no, hold on. Oh, my headset disconnected. Hold on. No, I don't think it died. Uh, it'll just be one second there, Rick. All right. Oh, wait, there it goes. All right, I think we're back. Can you say something, Rick? Yeah, hello. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Okay, okay. my bad. That we have to be open to the possibility that we're wrong. All right, so he goes on to say, one can only speculate on Bart Ehrman's reasons. Stubbornness, ego, peer pressure, uh, fearing a loss of financial success or social status, family issues, who knows? And I have a video on this called uh, An Unemployed Blogger Talks About Bart's Wife is the name of the video, uh, where he talks about, the, he speculates that the reason that Bart Ehrman kind of poo-poos on the evidence for mythicism is that his wife is a Christian. And so it's not that it's implausible that somebody might either to keep their job or to, you know, uh, be sensitive to what a spouse might find offensive, might refrain from arguing certain things. Once you have Bart Ehrman drawing the conclusions that he does, it seems to me that, yeah, it doesn't seem to me, you know, if, if nothing that he's published thus far about the Bible uh, or about religion is uh, you know, going too far with his wife, then I think his wife is perfectly okay with the fact that you know, they don't see eye to eye on things. Yeah, I. That's almost verbatim what I said. <laughs> uh, so uh, once again, they're taking things, this is quote mining. So they're taking things out of context and reading into them what isn't there. So what has happened here is in, in reality, in the real world, instead of the fantasy world that they've constructed here, in the real world, someone asked me, could it be because of his wife? And then I gave an answer. I said, probably not, but here's some reasons how it could be the case. And and I gave reasons why probably not, and my reasons for probably not are the exact same ones that McGrath just gave. Um, now, other people have made that argument to me multiple times. Uh, and so when I do this, when people ask, like, what are the possibilities? I say, well, we don't know. There's a bunch of possibilities. Now, list a bunch of possibilities. This will be one of them. But at no point have I ever said the reason Ehrman takes the position he's doing is because of his wife. I've never argued that. Uh, it's just usually on the list of things because a lot of people talk about it uh, and it comes up a lot. And even then I say it's it's a possibility. And the one place where I, I come anywhere close to like affirming it at all, I immediately afterwards say, but it's probably just status quo bias, right? It, it, he's more concerned about his peers than about his wife's opinion of, of what he thinks about Jesus. So, um, so you know, that, that's the actual thing that I said. Uh, and it's much more nuanced and complex than the bullshit that they just spun. But notice that they just straw manned and fabricated and, and all of this has just happened. And and why are we talking about this? What does this have to do with my article? <laughs> do you see my problem here? Like this is all distraction. This is all sideshow. Uh, this is bullshit. Like uh, we're, they still haven't gotten to my article or anything relevant uh, in this content. So is yeah. this, would this classify as the technical uh, definition of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've often talked about uh, the, the Frankfurt definition of bullshit. Uh, he wrote a book called Bullshit. Uh, I think it's called On Bullshit. Uh, and for people who want to know, like the technical, his definition of the technical term of bullshit, the bullshit is different from lying. A liar knows, the liar cares about the truth. That's why they're lying. A bullshitter doesn't care what's true. They just want you to believe what they're saying. So it doesn't even matter to them whether it's true or not. That's bullshit. Uh, and I, so in this particular case, no, I, I think, I think it matters to them, uh, what's true. Uh, and, but I, I'm not really sure. Cause that, like, like I can explain, uh, you know, the, the whole, what is, is it Hanlon's law? I don't know. There's a certain rule. But it's the idea that you shouldn't attribute to malice. What can just as easily be explained by incompetence. Um, now there are many occasions where I can, I can show that it is not easily explained by incompetence. It has to be malice. Uh, but it, I have to give evidence for that. And I do. Whenever I say that, I give evidence for it. Um, but in this case, I think it's just incompetence. I think uh, that when potential theists went off and did that, I don't think he did it dishonestly. I just think he's bad 
at reading. He's, he's following these methodologies where he's importing things into the text. He's ignoring things that are in the text. He's getting out of it what he wants there to have been. And then he creates a straw man and defeats it and then feels good about himself for having done that. Like, I think it's all sincere. It's just incompetent. Uh, I, I don't think he's lying. I don't think he knows the truth about what I actually said. Uh, I, I think he's deceived himself into thinking I said something that I didn't. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to go on to the next section now and try to power through uh, these next few if we can, because we, we do have a lot of content to cover. Um, so this one's, um, I, I titled this Mixed Messages on the Evidence. And because I, I, this is something that you had mentioned before, that there's like a lot of mixed messaging on uh, the, the evidence for Jesus, uh, especially within this one interview. But I, I have another clip, a very poignant clip uh that worked in here that's uh gonna prove to be a problem so um nice if, you, if you're ready i'll just go ahead and play yeah. it roll it oh shit wait share that tab okay there we go so he says in the second paragraph there's also of course the unfortunate public who believe there are mountains of evidence for a historical jesus because they keep being told that and i saw that and i'm thinking who's telling them that who's, who's saying that there are mountains of evidence for a historical jesus yeah, um, sorry, I'm stopping it uh, pretty pretty quick here uh, because the ah, crap. I think I forgot to I forgot to export the one. I've got um, we're about to get into a clip from Bart Ehrman saying this, but also Bart Ehrman says this. Uh, I've got this one blog post that Bart Ehrman said it on where he talks about he doesn't use the exact phrase mountains of evidence, but he definitely says that Jesus is better attested than Josephus. So, um, I mean, I, I feel like that would at least, you know, uh, amount to mountain of evidence. Oh, you're muted, Rick. Oh, Rick, Rick you're muted. Uh, I actually have um, a transcript of Bart Ehrman at a conference when he he said he compared the evidence for Jesus to the evidence for evolution, for example. So, um, yeah, again, he doesn't use the exact word mountains, but he absolutely says exactly that. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, let's see your evidence and then I'll I'll present mine and then we'll see. OK. Well, I mean, I feel like this. This is this is something that that does come out of a certain brand of, of Christian apologetics. Right. Um, but I mean, if, if you if you pay enough attention to to figures like uh, like, like Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel or Jay Warner Wallace or, or or some of these characters who aren't scholars, then yes, you'll hear about these mountains of evidence. What is the evidence? It's not good enough that it kind of fits well with your theory. What's the actual evidence of it? We have multiple sources that talk about Jesus independently of each other. I mean, just the ones we've talked about. You've got Mark, M, Q, L. You've got John. John had multiple sources. There's a sign source. There's a discourse source. There's, and there are multiple sources in John. But right there, you've got seven sources just in the Gospels of the New Testament that are independent of each other. The book of Acts talks about Jesus. Other books of the New Testament talk mention the historical Jesus. Paul says concrete things about the historical Jesus. Paul knows his brother. I mean, if he didn't exist, his brother would surely know it. It's like, you know, how much evidence do you need? But when you delve in. How, mu how much evidence do you need when you have Acts? Rich, uh, Rickard, uh, uh, Richard, sorry, fuck. <laughs> how much uh, sorry, you muted again there, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, that, that was your clip. Good. Yeah. Um, I have an even better one. Well, I, I don't have a video. there. Somewhere there's a video of this. So this is a transcript of a video. Um, I might have a link to it, but I don't want to, like, tangle into it and try and make that work. But uh, this, is, this is me doing a poor uh, uh, reading of a one-act play by Bart Ehrman. Uh, <laughs> what he said at this occasion someone asked him like what are the chances that jesus didn't exist uh and it's like why why do you think uh they, they said something like why do you think there's enough evidence to believe jesus exists and, and he, this is what he said this is a quote well i do i mean that's why i wrote the book okay yeah i have a whole book on it so there is a lot of evidence i mean there is so much evidence that it is it is not look I know in the crowds you all run around with, it's commonly thought that Jesus did not exist. Let me tell you, once you get outside your conclave, there's nobody who, I mean, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. It is it is not an issue for scholars. There is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics, ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field 
who doubts that Jesus existed. Now that is not evidence. That is not evidence. But just because everybody thinks so doesn't make it evidence. But if you want to know about the theory of evolution versus the theory of creationism, and every scholar and every reputable institution in the world, reputable, use the word reputable, anyway, <laughs> thinks and believes in evolution, it may not be evidence. But if you've got a different opinion, you better have a pretty good piece of evidence yourself. The reason for thinking Jesus existed is because he is abundantly attested in early sources. That's why. And I give the details in my book. Early and independent sources indicate that certainly that Jesus existed. That's the word certainly. One author we know about knew Jesus' brother and knew Jesus' closest disciple, Peter. He's an eyewitness to both Jesus' closest disciples and his brother. So, I mean, I'm sorry, but again, I respect your disbelief. But I, 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 you know, if you want to go where the evidence goes, I think that atheists have done themselves a disservice by jumping on the bandwagon of mythicism. Because, frankly, it makes you look foolish to the outside world. If that's what you're going to believe, you just look foolish. You are much better off going with historical Jesus or with historical evidence and arguing historically rather than coming up with the theory that Jesus didn't exist. End quote. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe I believe if anybody wants to look that up and hear it for yourself, it's it's when Bart uh, and I, I know this because I've, I've had to watch this video so many times. It's when Bart accepted the humanist award. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there he gave was a, a speech. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was. And so that's uh, that's it. I don't know if you've ever seen the picture online of Bart standing. I think it's like with a fat dude uh, sculpture or, or uh, award or something like that. And he gives this big long speech about how, oh, you're ridiculous if you're a mythicist is you know yeah. the overall tone no, of it. That, that's literally what we're talking about. And then McGrath does the same thing later in the video where he, he compares the evidence for Jesus to the evidence for evolution. He does the that, same that, fucking that, thing. And yeah. as, even though right here he's saying, no, we don't do that. No. And then he fucking does it. And that, that's the shit that pisses me off, man. God damn it. Yeah, uh, he's. I've actually got him digging himself a pretty deep hole, both him uh, and and Kip, I guess. And then that clip comes right after that. So okay, <laughs> delve into actual scholarship. I think I, I think you know uh, scholars who who work in the field will agree that uh, it's it, there. The evidence for an historical Jesus is is not especially strong, and it is really problematic. And there's nothing we can do about that. But the, the, uh, the evidence is actually scant, vague, weak, and problematic. And I'm sitting here going, amen. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, Richard uh, conceded, as he often does in public, the one in three chance that a Jesus existed, which in the past I had always considered as as just very low on, on, on the basis of, of his, uh, his mathematical model. And I started to rethink this in, uh, in different terms, um, where for any other person from that, from that social strata within, within early Jewish culture, Maybe those are actually fantastic odds. Uh, you know, what are the odds of the vast majority of, of people who have existed that we know nothing about to have existed? Uh, you know, it's, it's impossible to quantify because the vast majority. I, I, I feel this like this is a... Kip Davis is bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah. He doesn't know how to calculate any of this. Uh, what is the probability that most of the people who existed existed? Um, it's not one. It's much better than one in three, Kip, because you just it's a circular argument. But anyway, <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a lot. Of, that was a word salad from him. Um, and of course, because he and McGrath both lie about having read my book. Well, no, let's be fair to Kip. Kip admits he hasn't read my book. He only read parts of it. Uh, and, and so he wouldn't know about necessarily other parts of it. But Grath claims and swears that he read the book, but he's constantly talking as if he has no fucking idea what's in the book. Uh, I give several examples. Um, Socrates is an important example of the evidence we have for Socrates is good. If we had that for Jesus, we'd be done, right? Like there would, I would be a historicist and that would, that would be the argument. Uh, I did a whole chapter in Jesus from Outer Space on all the other people that people keep claiming from Hannibal to Herod and Typus and whatever. The, the issue is not that uh, unknown people, like unfamous people, um, and, and of course, we have to assume that Jesus is unfamous because the Gospels claim he was super fucking famous. So you have to admit that the Gospels are lying. If you're willing to admit that, okay, and then you've got, a, you can start building a plausible historical Jesus, uh, and you have to say he's a nobody. He's just some Galilean preacher who got himself killed. He wasn't even on Josephus's radar because Josephus records a ton of these 
you know, messianic pretenders who claim to be Joshua and are going to like reinstitute Israel. He doesn't even include Jesus among them. Uh, even if, even if the testimony of Flavianum was authentic, he doesn't include them among the other pretenders <clears throat> because he wasn't even that famous. So you could admit that, but that isn't what our argument is. I've never said that the probability that Jesus didn't exist is low because he's a nobody. Uh, I actually argue the opposite. I say like, he was just a random nobody. Um, the base probably the base rate of him existing would actually be reasonably high. Uh, the reason his base rate is low is because he's right out of the gate of mythological celestial super being. Um, not every rando from Galilee is a myth heavily mythologized super being right out of the gate. Uh, and so that's your reference class, right? And that's the, it, Kip is just rolling right over all that, forgetting it. There's no idea what the argument is or what we're doing with the math here or any of that. Uh, and, and it's just that's it's illustrative of them not checking. Like Kip is not even interested in checking what my actual argument is, how the mathematical model works, what evidence is based on. He has zero interest in that. Uh, and yet he's completely just pontificating about what it is and what it isn't uh, as if he knows. And, and and that you have to ask, why is he doing that? Why didn't he just admit, you know, I haven't read it. I don't know what case he makes for it. Uh, like he could just say that, uh, but no, he has to, to spin bullshit as we see happening here. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's continue. This is a relatively short uh, section here, but uh, I think we're going to be getting into McGrath here soon. The vast majority of people who have ever lived leave no mark uh, whatsoever on uh, on recorded history. We Literally, have, what I have said myself. Really little, but more than any. <laughs> Sorry. Literally, what I have said myself. Like he's not saying anything new. I said exactly this myself. But go on, yeah. Right. Well, I, I was also going to ask, isn't it a bit of an equivalence fallacy, uh, or, 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 you know, like a comparison fallacy? Because I think comparing, but w that may be what you were talking yeah, about. Just a, yeah, ago. fallacy of false equivalence. Yes. Uh, in the sense that, um, and what we would say in Bayesian terms, it's a, it's the wrong reference class. So um, he's talking about us ordinary people. Jesus is not an ordinary person, right? Like right out of the gate, like literally out of, it's, it's not like Jesus is an ordinary person, we have memoirs about him. And then 10 years later, the wild myths get spun about him. No, it's wild myths right out of the gate. Bam, nothing but wild myths. Uh, Paul, crazy wild myths. Uh, then you get to the gospels, more and more crazy wild myths, crazy wild myths, just everywhere. That's all we've got. That's not an ordinary guy, right? Like that's, he belongs to a different reference class than just ordinary farmers, preachers, activists, etc. cetera. Um, and I've literally explicitly make this point in that chapter uh, in Jesus from Outer Space. Uh, where I talk about the other guys. I have a whole section on how we reference class people. Why do we not doubt, you know, if Josephus mentioned some random functionary in the court of Herod, why do we not, why are we not suspicious of that? Because those guys usually existed. That's that's the reference class, right? Those, those guys typically turn out to have existed. <clears throat> but wild, crazy celestial superheroes with crazy myths written about them? Actually, those guys tend not to exist. Like, like if you look at the examples in that reference class, not a lot of some of them are historical, but not a lot. And that's the thing is like you got to look at the reference class. That's the reference class. You can't just say Jesus was just some ordinary person because he was not. Uh, even if he literally was, he's not in the record, and and that's the problem. That's our, that's the problem we face. And and it's funny that they're even kind of admitted that and then immediately took it away. Right? They're saying like, oh yeah, the evidence sucks. And then here they are immediately like trying to argue that no, 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 the, the evidence is good. And and you'll see this kind of this pendulum switch uh, a lot in this video. Yeah. And that's, that's what, it, that's the part of it that's it's starting right now is this, yeah. this switch to, oh, well, actually, <laughs> now that I think about it, it's great evidence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any person who is first investigating whether there was an itinerant creature that some people thought might be the Messiah, but who never minted coins or you know erected monuments. What do you expect to find, right? I mean, if you deal with ancient sources and ancient history, if you find that somebody, you know, it's like, you know, this is a letter, you know, that we have reason to think is authentic by somebody who met his brother. It's like, what more than that do you expect, right? That's better than we have for most ancient people. And yeah, when it comes to Carrier's model, he makes the the lack of certain kinds of evidence, the the things that we don't know, makes it all part of this one equation. And it seems to me that that's very problematic when applied to history in general and ancient history in particular. If we <laughs> considering no all evidence is bad, Rick, what yeah. the fuck are you doing? I also don't know what he's talking about in terms of my mathematical model. I don't get the impression from anything he said here that he even knows what it is. Certainly not on this, right? He seems to think that somehow 
the argument from silence in the general record, I'm counting against historicity when in fact I explicitly say it has no effect on the probability of historicity. Like mm -hmm. all chapter ends at chapter eight, like no effect. Uh, the only thing that has an effect are actual little pieces of evidence that suggest he didn't exist, but they have to be positive evidence that. The only argument from silence that's valid uh, is from the letters of Paul. And there's a particular reason why the argument from silence, silence works there at least probabilistically, it's not like decisive, but it's probabilistic. But he's not even talking about that. Like he's, he doesn't even, he seems to think that I'm counting the silence in the general record as evidence against historicity. And, and that's the opposite of what I do. So uh, he doesn't know, he, he swore, I know you didn't include the clip, but anybody who watches that video, early on, he fucking swears repeatedly in different forms, swears that he read my book. But this statement right here, and there's many others he makes about, like, demonstrate conclusively that he did not. Uh, and so, <laughs> uh, so what's it? What's he up to here? Like, why is he just stone cold fucking lying like this? Like, what, what is his game? I I don't fully understand what his mission is, um, but it's not telling the truth. I can tell you that. Yeah, I mean, if so, uh, here's my thinking on it. It would is pretty much what you just said, I guess. But uh, is that if like kind of a if he has read the book then he should know you don't count this general argument from silence as part of the evidence like in your model right. but here he's saying uh, uh, uh carrier includes this as a principal like thing <laughs> in the mathematical model yeah. and that's like not what you do and you know so it's one thing's got to be a lie here Right. Either like he read his uh, either he read your book. And so he's lying about you, including it, or he hasn't read your book. And, you know, he it, um, therefore he's just making shit up later that he thinks is in your book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's also Mott and Bailey. So I have an article people can check on my site called Mott and Bailey uh, as as a rhetorical tactic where uh, you you have a like a ridiculous position and then people start showing that your position is ridiculous. So you retreat to a less ridiculous position. This seems kind of like the position you were holding before, but it's different. And then, uh, and then people go, oh, okay, whatever. And then once everybody's forgotten the conversation, you run back to the ridiculous position and keep defending it. And, and he's done that here multiple times already, where, where he, he says something that is, looks like the safe position, like, oh yeah, yeah, the evidence is problematic, amen, right? It's scarce and problematic, amen. And then uh, that that's the that's the safe position, but then as soon as the the threat of my argument has been removed and they've changed the subject and they're off to something else, he's completely forgotten that, and now he's gone back to the ridiculous position that uh, you know they're like oh no the evidence is 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 super solid and you can't count this against anything at all it doesn't reduce the probability at all and and how how dare he think that it does and, and you know it's like this there's these are incongruous positions. But he's running from one to the other as needed to defend the faith, uh, or at least defend whatever beliefs that he wants to defend. So he's busy defending a belief that he has rather than trying to figure out what's true, rather than actually honestly, like rationally examining the case. He's not interested in it. He doesn't want to read the book. He doesn't want to know what my actual arguments are. He doesn't want to study the mathematical model. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't care. And that's clear. It's totally clear from the way he talks here and also the way he's talked in other places. And I, like I said, I've documented that multiple times on my blog that, that he does this a lot. This is not suddenly a new thing that he's doing in this video. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's continue. If we find a tombstone that says here lies Fred and says nothing else, and we have no other information, if the tombstone is authentic, we should conclude that it's probable that there was a Fred, right? Yeah. And so as soon as some detail that we have about Jesus is more probable than not, then the historicity of Jesus is more probable than not. We have to go for a more natural explanation that Paul got information from other people. And some of the way he talks about meeting with James, with Peter, uh, as well as the hints that he had relatives and others that he uh, opposed and now no longer does so, suggests that there is a straightforward historical explanation that is compatible with what Paul actually says. Yeah. Uh, mythicists get really annoyed when I make comparisons between them and young earth creationists and intelligent design proponents and folks like that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he, he ends up, yeah, you were just you were you yourself, James McGrath, were complaining about that half an hour ago. 
now you're doing it. The very thing that you complained about doing. Yeah, that that's that's what happened there. Uh, also, he's 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 wrong about the math. Like, I, I don't want to get into that in detail here because it, it's people can learn that elsewhere. I've written about it many times, but it, it is not the case that as soon as you have any piece of evidence that is more likely on one theory than another, that that theory is then automatically more likely um, than the other, right? So it is possible. And, and for people who, this is, it's easy to show this, people know, like you, obviously you can have evidence that supports someone committing a murder, but that the, all the evidence together tells you that they didn't, right? So like a single piece of evidence cannot decide the case. So you can say it's more likely that this evidence would exist if you did commit the murder, but we have you on video in fucking Paris. So there's obviously no fucking way you committed the murder, right? So like mm -hmm. the, the thing is like, you can't, it can't, it doesn't work that way, but the fact that he thinks it does means he doesn't know anything about how logic works. Uh, and, and this is another thing that <laughs> it is very frustrating with historians generally is that they don't actually know how logic works. They don't know how, they don't know why their conclusions follow from the premises and they cannot explain it. They just feel in their gut that it does, like it feels right or whatever. Uh, and this is this isn't actually a serious problem in the field and I'm not the only one to have pointed this out. Um, David Hackett Fisher wrote a book called Historian's Fallacies that's all about this where he, he gives exam numerous examples through multiple fields of history uh, of this being a problem in history. And it is still a problem in history. But um, at least, you know, like you can trust the critical acumen of most historians uh, simply because like their in innate intuition is reliable in the sense that they, they don't they can't explain why it is. It just is. Um, but McGrath's intuition is massively unreliable. Uh, and I've caught him doing like ridiculous things multiple times. And it, it's funny for him to talk about the tombstone thing. That's super funny because. Uh, there was a time not long ago, uh, I guess it was 10 years ago now, so there was a while, um, that he was seriously arguing. He seriously argued that the reason we don't have inscriptions attesting to Jesus is that no one erected inscriptions except governments. <laughs> he forgot about tombstones, but anyway, uh, that's wildly false, wildly false. So there's only two possibilities there. Either he knew it was wildly false and he fucking lied. And then you have to ask why. Uh, or he literally doesn't fucking know anything about ancient history and doesn't know anything about the epigraphic uh, uh, tendency of the Roman Empire in the Hellenistic period. Um, doesn't know anything about the evidence. Um, it's also, it's uh, particularly embarrassing because he could have just made the argument that I made, which is that, we don't expect any inscriptions attesting to Jesus. So the fact that we don't have any is not relevant to the historicity of Jesus. Like I literally say that that's in the book that he claims and swears that he read, but clearly hasn't. Um, anyway, so it's funny for him to talk about tombstones when there was a while ago when he denied that tombstones even existed uh, because he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, but he pretends he is. You notice the confidence with which he acts like I'm a member of the guild. I fucking know what I'm talking about. You should just believe me. Um, no, you shouldn't actually like he says false things so many times. You really shouldn't trust him. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I, I document this multiple times. If this video isn't enough, uh, go, go search James McGrath and you'll find out like how not competent he actually is in this subject. But anyway, um, that's my rant soapbox ended. Uh, now, what do you think about uh, as far as like the, the content of, of OHJ and like your, your method that you use in it? Um, well, what, what, uh, what do you think about the possibility that you know, maybe he, he did read it. He just, you know, uh, doesn't accurately, uh, accurately recall anything from the book and, <laughs> you know, he's just making statements. Um, I would hope that an honest, so here's what an honest person would do. And I could give an example of myself. Like, so like people often ask me, like, uh, what do you think about what this scholar said, name a book or whatever. I'll say, you know, I read that like 10 years ago. I'm not, I don't really remember it clearly enough to give you an opinion. I can, I can report to you my emotional memory of reading the book, like what my reaction to it was, but I can't articulate uh, why, like what was specifically wrong or right or whatever. Um, and, and this is because, you know, I don't remember, right? It's been so long. So if you're an honest person, that's what you would do, right? You'd say like, well, I didn't really understand his mathematical model. That's what you would say. Or if you did understand it, 
but forgot, you would say, I can't really remember. I remember like I grasp it for a moment, but I don't remember it now. This is how an honest person acts. But no, a liar says, oh, this is what his mathematical model says and just spews complete false bullshit. Uh, that's dishonest. Uh, and it, it, there is a legit question to what extent does he know he's being dishonest or is he literally clinically delusional? Like that, it's a separate question. I can't answer that because liars sound exactly like delusional people. There, there's no objective uh, differences that you can tell. Um, sometimes you can tell. There's, there's sometimes clues. Like William Lane Craig, I can pretty much peg as a liar. There's I have enough evidence I can build for that. And so have many other people done. Uh, and so there are other people like in certain circumstances, you can kind of catch them. There's like a moment where you say, ah, that's the give. That's the tell. Um, but with James McGrath, I don't know. Like, is he just a bullshitter where he doesn't really care and doesn't remember things because he didn't want to remember things? Like, is, is he delusional? Um, or is he a grifter? I, I don't get the feeling that he's a grifter in the way that, like, William Lane Craig is totally a grifter. Um, but I, I can't say that I know what his motives are. Like, all I can say is that he's wildly, wildly contradicting himself and reality. And uh, how do you explain that? I leave that up to the audience. Uh, you have to figure it out yourself. All right. So this next one is a very uh, specific claim, short clip, uh, relatively short, um, about your proficiency in ancient literacy uh, <laughs> studies and stuff. Yeah, this one's funny. All right. The literacy of disciples. Aren't they usually talking about whether the disciples can write? Because it seems to me, like in this blog, Carrier's talking about whether they can read. So he says, for example, it's not incredible they were fishermen. Paul never mentions it, nor First Clement or Hebrews or any defensible early texts. And then he goes on to say, Paul would have made hay out of the fact that all of, made hay of the fact all over his epistles, because that would mean he alone and not they could read the scriptures, which he attests was absolutely essential to demonstrate so, faith. Go on. Yeah, yeah, no. So this is this is one of these 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 places where I feel like like Car Carrier has not carefully enough done his homework. Um, yeah, and I checked after I read this. I went and looked in his book to see if he if he has actually uh, consulted any of the of, of you know the the far reaching uh, literacy studies of the period. Uh, Catherine Hetcher wrote a monumental book uh, back in two thousand six. More recently, Mike Wise has written on this. I think in in two thousand nineteen. Um, so there's there's a lot that he's taking for granted here in terms of I, I mean there's several things going on. What does it mean to be literate versus illiterate within this within this culture? Um, you know, you people could read things and never have any uh, mechanical ability at all, or even uh, con conceptual ability at all to actually write or compose literature. You know, that's one of the disconnects. But I think uh, one of the things that, uh, that gets missed here is just that for the vast majority of people, yes, uh, literacy rates uh, in, the, in the area at the period were very low in, in terms of people's ability to actually read and actually write. But the, the vast majority of people did not experience or learn scripture by reading it. People were sitting in synagogues and listening to others read these texts all the time, uh, and you know this is this is how people came to experience uh, this literature. So even if you couldn't read, that doesn't mean anything with regards to to your ability or or your effectiveness to to take ideas that you've heard in the synagogue and texts that you know about without even necessarily having to be able to read them. You know they're there, and and. Um, you know, using those to interpret your world around you. Uh, and then there's, there's one other thing I want to I want to say here on this point as well. Um, and, and that is uh, this idea that somehow uh, Paul's uh, social status would have been guaranteed within the church on the basis of his ability to read, even if he was the only one who could do so, is silly. Um, and in fact, I think a, a strong case can be made that one of the reasons he does emphasize his commitment to what's written in the scriptures a case could be made that that the reason he does so as strenuously as as he does is because this wasn't the great uh, flex that uh, that he thought it was among the people in the Jerusalem church. Uh, one of the things that we do know is that there was not certainly uh, in in many segments of society there was not a great stigma attached to one's inability to read. I, that last argument I don't understand. So he's trying to argue <laughs> that Paul repeatedly repeatedly relies on citations of scripture because no one cared about citations of scripture that am i reading that wrong is that is that what he argued or can you steel man his argument for me like am i wrong i mean no i i don't think that you're wrong i mean that's 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 what i got out of it. <clears throat> yeah so. I, that was a dumb <laughs> argument there, there's a ton of things wrong like almost everything he said is wrong like wildly wrong but the um the most embarrassing thing here is <laughs> 
I hate doing this, but he's forcing me to fucking do this because he challenged my ignorance on this. Um, okay, here we go. Are we ready? So I got my PhD at Columbia University. My PhD advisor, my graduate studies advisor through the whole program for like 10, like 10 years, 11 years, was William V. Harris, who was literally the world's leading expert on ancient literacy. He wrote the definitive textbook on ancient literacy. Uh, the um, Kip Davis mentions uh, Catherine Hesser, uh, who wrote literacy, a book on literacy in Judea, like for the Hebrews. Hesser just takes Harris's work and expands it to Palestine, and she gets no different results than him. So she basically corroborates everything he found. I also took uh, multiple graduate level courses for my PhD program under Raffaella Cribbiore, who's one of the world's leading experts on ancient education. Um, and I read her books on this. Uh, and I wrote a actual, like one of the chapters of my dissertation, my PhD dissertation at Columbia University, an Ivy League school, <laughs> was on ancient education. And I republished that chapter as a book, Science Education in the Early Roman Empire. All right. So I fucking know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And I can confirm that everything Kip Davis said is bullshit. Uh, no, not, not everything. I'll say not every single thing because, you know, he said a few things that are true. Like most people are illiterate. A lot of people get information through oral lore. I have a whole section in uh, science education in the early Roman Empire, which is that one little book on ancient education. I have a section in there on how illiterate juries at trials could actually absorb scientific information through certain trials certain like it, scientific information they actually did have things like uh like doctors could do things like autopsies and stuff and and report scientific evidence for for cases and criminal cases uh it's extremely rare it didn't happen commonly uh but anyway i talk about it right anyway so what did harris and cribbiori definitely instill in me personally through through my direct uh apprenticeship with them and through their books um, several things, uh, one of which is that we know from both science and extensive cross-cultural history and ancient evidence that what Kip is talking about is literally impossible. It is not possible to, quote unquote, have heard the entire Old Testament spoken out to you somehow. I don't know how this is like, he hasn't really thought through the logistics of this. Like how many Sundays or Saturdays in this case do you have to go to synagogue? To hear, like, at what point do you hear the whole Torah read, right? Like, like, how crazy do you have to be to have done this? But anyway, how long of a life would it take? But anyway, even if you do it, we know for a fact that intellectually it is not possible to remember all of that information in the way that is used in what's called Pesher, which is a particular style of interpreting uh, interlocking scriptures to find hidden meanings which is what the Christians are doing. All throughout Paul, he talks about how Christians are reading new meanings into uh, ancient scriptures. And he can quote them verbatim. And he talks about how like the, the evidence for the gospel and the charisma of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus comes from scripture. We can verify it from scripture and so on. So my argument, and they only talk about like half the evidence I gave in the article. They skip the other half. Um, but this is the one that they actually talk about some of the evidence that I gave. Uh, but the others, they, they don't hardly at all. Um, but in this one, they, they at least touch on some of it. They don't talk about all of it. But the, the argument is that it is very clear that Christianity was absolutely dependent on the ability to read the scriptures and to read them in interlocking complex relationships that requires literacy. There, there's no form, there's no way to learn how to do this. If you're just some illiterate person, like you, you don't have the skills for doing this even mentally, much less like physically in terms of like writing and, and reading. Uh, you need actually the ability to do symbol symbolism and phonemes. Like, like writing is actually crucial to the actual intellectual process that's necessary to do the kinds of things that we see in the Christian pressure logic that we see in Paul. Um, so, you, and this is, again, this is Harris, Cribiori, they all explain this. Like you can't do these things without an extensive education, which means Jesus, if Jesus was, historical he had to have been a rabbi he had to have been an educated rabbi because there weren't separate schools there wasn't like a school that like drilled you in oral lore and didn't teach you to read the torah like th there were schools that drilled you in oral lore that's how the mishnah was memorized and, and transmitted through the rabbinical schools but you you went as a child at age seven and you spent like seven plus years 
having this drilled into you. You had to have it. You had extensive education to memorize the Mishnah. Uh, only extensively, ed, you know, institutionally educated people could do this. Those same schools also taught you how to read and write in Hebrew and learn this in the Torah, because there, there's no such thing as separate schools for this. Like one school did both things. So there's no way to get the one skill and not get the other. So the point is, is that Paul makes it very clear that the scriptures are absolutely essential to constructing Christianity and making arguments for anything in Christianity. This means that the first apostles cannot possibly have been illiterate because had they been, Paul could be saying this all the time. It's like, they can't even read the scriptures. The scriptures are the secret oracles of God. I can read the scriptures. So I know more than these guys. He never says that. He actually is deferential to them. Uh, he complains about people saying that they're more charismatic and rhetorically skilled than him, actually. So actually, he complains about them being more educated than him, uh, which is the opposite of what Kip Davis is saying. But anyway, um, the, the point being is that the, the evidence is quite clear that it is impossible for the first apostles to have been illiterate fishermen. Uh, they could have been fishermen. That's a whole. I, they skipped that whole part uh, of my section uh, because educated rabbis were required to apply uh, a, a manual trade. So we have rabbis or sandal makers, carpenters, etc. They were also literate, educated people. Uh, and so they could be fishermen as well. So that being a fisherman does not mean you're illiterate. Um, that was another argument that I made in there that they ignored. Uh, but anyway, the point being is that the evidence is very clear that it, it is impossible for the apostles to have been illiterate. And Kip Davis's response is that I haven't read the literature uh, on literacy. And it, my whole argument is based on the literature on on, on literacy, ancient literacy, right? So uh, so it, it just really just fucking flipped my lid when I heard this. It's like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Clearly, he has not read any of the literature on this. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, and yet he acts like he does. Uh, and and it, it's very frustrating, and it's hard to, like, maintain a jovial attitude about it. But anyway, that that's what happened. Um, and yeah, I do, I do cite that scholarship in... Uh, I don't cite Hetzer, but I do cite Paris, I think, in um, uh, on the historicity of Jesus when I talk about this. Yeah, well, I was going to say uh, the one thing that uh, Kip didn't do in this is that he didn't finish like his thought there. Because like he says, I went to check Carrie to see if he cited any of the most recent stuff. <laughs> and then, you know, he and then he goes into like what what he knows about the ancient literacy studies and all that. And he never he never comes back around and says carrier cited these people for it. right, or right he yeah. says this about it well it like, sounds he, so here's the bullshit i here's my bullshit analysis the bullshit he only mentioned hetzer so he doesn't know about cribiori harris or any of the other authors in this field so he only knows hetzer he just checked if i cited hetzer there's no reason to cite hetzer that she doesn't say anything that changes anything uh regarding what harris said right also we're talking about Greek. So, um, you know, Paul is writing in Greek and so forth. So we're really talking Harris, not Hetzer. Um, but it is true. Like it would be relevant. Like if Hetzer found something different than Harris regarding education in Hebrew, um, then, then that would be relevant. Right. But she does, she didn't. So there, there isn't any reason to cite her on this. Um, but yeah, like I, I could totally, totally add her to, uh, to the, the bibliography, of on the history of Jesus, it wouldn't change any conclusion in there. It wouldn't change this argument either. Uh, but I, I think he just threw her name out. He, Kip likes to do this. He likes to throw names out uh, to suggest that somehow it's relevant that uh, it's not in my bibliography. Therefore, I don't I don't know about it. Uh, and, and it somehow contradicts what I said, even though it doesn't. Um, he does this a lot where he tries to name drop. But when you go check the names, they don't say what he said. <laughs> And anyway, uh, so yeah, so no, yeah, I don't cite Hetzer, but I do cite Harris, who is like, like I said, nothing different from Hetzer in terms of the results that we're talking about here. Yeah. All right. So the, the next section that we got is our favorite topic, and that's <laughs> Daniel Boyerin, because <laughs> uh, uh, Boyerin gets brought up. And so we're going to listen to see what, what issues do they have with Boyerin now? Oh, but let's pause for a moment. I don't think Boyerin is even relevant to the article that, are, that they are supposed to be talking about. So I want to emphasize that, like, this is fun, um, but we're, we're changing the, like, they're changing the subject again. Now, somehow we've gotten off, like, they, they it was, it's like, I don't know, like a, a cat with a shiny object. It's very difficult to get them 
to focus on the article they're supposed to be talking about. They rarely do, like in, in the whole video, like it, they touch on it occasionally. But most of the video is these random tangents, like Boyer and, but different article. Anyway, so yeah, proceed, but this is what they say. Yeah, well, I think that the, con the context for this is that Kip is bringing up what he calls yet another point that proves that basically you're incompetent at your job. Right. Yeah. 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 He always and, frames it and, that way. And then I disprove him by citing dozens of scholars agreeing with me. And then he like claims that, Oh, well that doesn't matter. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah, let's, let's go with Boyer. I, I pointed this out uh, publicly before too, is I, I don't think this is, uh, this is so much an issue with scholars failing to check or to, to uh, uh, confirm uh, their own ideas so much as I, I think many times uh, a carrier's tendency to read some of the, uh, the the background literature on this, the secondary source work, uh, can be poor or, or just, just outright misleading. Um, he, he continues to promote this, uh, this, this idea on the basis of, of something he read in a popular book written by Daniel Boyarin with regards to the, uh, the, the early Jewish background of the uh, suffering servantism. A popular book? Oh, it's just a popular book. It's right. not re replicated by dozens of peer-reviewed scholars. <laughs> yeah. Whatsoever. And it, it apparently doesn't, doesn't matter. Like the, yeah, yeah I guess the prestige aspect of. Daniel right. Boyer. He's one of the leading experts on Talmudic studies at UC Berkeley. And, and I mean, in the world, but he's at UC Berkeley as a professor. He, he's no slouch, Daniel Boyer, and he's not some rando. <clears throat> But anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's particularly funny for him to try to try to denigrate the book when he's about to try and make a false claim about what the book says. Because I know the rest of the clip because I was there as so I saw it happen. <laughs> Herman has a messianic figure in uh, in, in pre-Christian uh, Judaism, uh, and in my opinion, and in the opinion of of a number of other people who have uh, confronted him on this point, he's not he's either not carefully enough reading what Boyerin is trying to say which is more to do with the fact that we shouldn't be surprised that people came to apply texts like Isaiah 53 to the Christian movement. Uh, he, he's, he's not being careful enough in his evaluation of that to the point oh, he's just, he has a tendency to misrepresent. Uh, so, Kip Davis so is describing himself here and he doesn't know it. He thinks he's describing me, but he's describing himself. And I hope you have the receipts on this. Do you have? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I just I want to read this for everybody, and maybe we could do like a live sort of analysis of what Daniel Boyerin is saying here because I feel like excuse my literacy at this point. <clears throat> the idea of a suffering messiah is present in ancient medieval and early modern Judaism. This fact, at the very least, calls into question the truism that the formation and acceptance of this idea by followers of Jesus constituted the necessary and absolute breaking point with the religion of Israel. The suffering Messiah is part and parcel of Jewish tradition from antiquity to modernity. Not only, then, is the gospel drawing on Jewish tradition, but this idea remained a Jewish one long after Christianity had indeed been separated off in late antiquity. He, he also <laughs> cites Talmudic passages, uh, basically a bunch yeah. of things. That, like Half the arguments I give on the historicity of Jesus are just restatements of Boyerin. The other half are like, I think restatements of Hengel. Uh, and um, is it Hengel? I think it's Hengel. But um, anyway, so I'm just repeating what these experts say. It's Hengel. And and so uh, Kip Davis pulls this bullshit. Like, you're misreading them. I'm like, I know I'm not. Uh, they're, they're saying literally the same thing I'm saying. It's like, but you know what? I'm going to see if, are these guys outliers? Like, was I misled? Uh, and I checked and I found something like, it's not like three dozen of these fuckers, uh, super fucking experts in, um, Dead Sea Scrolls and Talmudic studies and stuff like major lights, uh, writing, publishing under peer review multiple times, multiple times, dozens of times, uh, the same thing, the same arguments, literally the same arguments that I advance in on the history of city of Jesus. Uh, and so I, it's like gaslighting. Kip Davis is fucking gaslighting us. He's claiming no one thinks these things. He's completely misread Boyer. And it's like, 
No, the things I said have been repeated multiple times under peer review, like dozens of times under peer review by actual experts in these subjects. Uh, it's not just Boyerin. Uh, and, and, and which means that Boyerin was correct. Like he didn't mislead me. I wasn't wrong to trust Boyerin on this. Boyerin, everything Boyerin said has been vindicated multiple, multiple, multiple times in the peer reviewed literature. Kit Davis doesn't check this shit and he doesn't want to check this shit. He doesn't care. Uh, and so, uh, so he just keeps spewing this bullshit. He's not checking, but he didn't check. There are multiple times when Kip Davis didn't check and I caught him badly. Uh, and I've done this, like, this is one of them where he claims like no one believes this. And then I found like dozens of scholars under peer review who said exactly the same things I did. Uh, he did the same thing unrelated to this, but he did the same thing with the Zechariah quote that I talk about in Philo. He makes these, pun he pontificates these confident assertions about how I got that wrong. And then I find like a dozen scholars who agree with me under peer review. Uh, Right. So this is what Kip Davis does. Like he'll accuse me of incompetence and, it, and it's like, okay, I guess I'll find like a dozen fucking competent scholars and apparently super competent peer reviewers who all approve this stuff multiple fucking times. Like how many times does it have to pass peer review before you will admit that it is not incompetent, that this is actually a competent expert position widely accepted in the field. Uh, and so Kip Davis does this so often that it, it is it literally enrages me. Like I'm fucking pissed off by this. Uh, and, and I, you know, I'm, I don't have patience for it anymore. Yeah. And I, I picked this one particular section right here cause it kind of encapsulates like the, 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 the basic point that Boyerin's trying to make. And so I just, I can't fathom how we are misrepresenting. Cause like if, if somebody's like, Oh, you're misreading that I'm like, well, am I? And so I go back and I reread it. I make sure I get, I get my wife, KC, she reads it. She's a way better at words than I am. Um, <laughs> and, and so like, I make sure that I understand what he's saying because like, there's no way that Boyerin can make this kind of statement. Like, Oh, the suffering and dying Messiah was not a break in the Israelite uh, religion. It, it was, it's part and parcel of the religion. So it's like when Christianity came about, whether that's because Jesus came about or people started making shit up, it doesn't really matter. But uh, when it came about, it was already in the religion. Like that's what he's saying yeah. here. That's just how fucking words work. Yeah, and, and you 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 quoted that's one quote from his book, but he he has others that are even more clear. Like he, there's one where he says that the like how does he put it? Let's see if we can find it. Um, here it is. <laughs> this is a quote. This is page, uh, let's see, 152 spanning 153 in the same book. Um, there is no evidence at all that any late ancient Jews read Isaiah, Isaiah 52 to 53 as referring to anyone but the Messiah. Yet there are several attestations, he says, of reading it messianically. And then he goes into, um, he cites evidence of it going back even further than that. Uh, and, uh, his quotation is here, like I've got it here. Um, let's see. Uh, it remains the case that, uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, oh, so, so there remains the case that we have a very strong textual base for the view that the suffering Messiah is based in deeply rooted Jewish texts early and late Jews. It seemed had no difficulty, whatever, with understanding a Messiah who would vicariously suffer to redeem the world. And, you know, he goes, you could get quotes after quote. And, and he does like cite uh, others. Now, there have been other scholars who've taken this, like run this ball even further than Aaron did. So Aaron's not alone in this. Uh, and there's others who've made even more affirming statements of the fact. But but yeah, the, this what Kip Davis is saying about what Aaron said is false. Like it's full on false. Aaron said what I said, uh, exactly what I wrote uh, in on the history of Jesus. It's just a rephrasing. It's just a paraphrase of Aaron. And Hengel mainly. Yeah. And I, I don't understand why they can't like understand that. Like I I don't know what's going on here that Kip reads something completely different from Boyerin than well, it's you know, it's important that. to note that he ignores all the other scholars that I cite, right? So I have like three yeah. dozen now. And I, I remember like there was a Twitter thing where uh, so like he doesn't want to read them. He doesn't care. He doesn't want to read them. He's, he's not interested in what the truth is. He doesn't care. It's clear. If he cared, he would read and he would like do a video on, oh, this is what I found. I went and checked that all these scholars do say these things. No, he doesn't fucking do that. Like, so, you know what his motives are, right? So, um, 
but uh, even his own dissertation advisor uh, made some arguments uh, similar to mine, right? Uh, and, you know, I document that. But, you know, I document that. And then, like, there's a thing where he says, oh, well, like, he, he did the thing where he picked uh, Presh. So there, there was Presh, who's a particular scholar way back when, who I, who's on my list of dozens of scholars. He picks Presh. And he says, oh, there's a bunch of guys who said lately that uh, he misinterpreted uh, some of the scrolls. Now, there's two things that are telltale about this. First, he ignored all the other evidence, picked the weak link and attacked it and claimed that he defeated the entire argument. Notice what I said at the front of this video. It's exactly the same thing. That's what he did. The other thing is he never gave an example that was relevant to the case. So yeah, maybe he pushed, got some interpretations wrong, but are any of those interpretations relevant to for example, George Brooks' arguments that he, you know, he relied on Pesh. So, and George Brooks can read the scrolls himself. He does not completely relying on Pesh on, on these things. Um, but he doesn't give any examples of it being relevant, right? This is like, oh, well, someone found some of his interpretations to be wrong. Okay, how is that relevant at all to anything they were talking about? Can you find a specific example where it's re relevant to this particular case, where, where George Book, your own dissertation advisor, incompetently fucked up his whole study that he's multi published multiple times because he relied on one particular thing that Pesh did. Like, can you give us an example? No, we can't, because he doesn't fucking care. He's not going to try. He's not going to find examples. He's not going to publish them. He's not going to talk about them. He's not going to do any of the work. He doesn't care. Uh, and, and I know he doesn't care, because if he cared, he would have done all these things by now and would have reported on his results. Uh, and so he hasn't. And so he keeps spewing this bullshit where he's like telling lies about what Barry Aaron said. He's ignoring what all the other dozens of scholars have said. It, you know, it's it's this kind of thing that, that is enraging. And, and I don't know why he does this. He doesn't have to. Right. Like he could just act like a sane, rational person. And I don't know why he doesn't do that. <laughs> but, you know, I can't control it. All I can do is document. All I do is document the facts. Here are the facts. You can check them yourself. You don't have to trust my word for it. You shouldn't trust Kip's word for it. You should check. You should always fucking check. And I guarantee you when you check, everything Davis says about me is going to fall apart. Uh, and so that's why you should check. Uh, and anyway, that that's that's my advice for people. It's just check. <laughs> I agree. Uh, there's a little bit more in, uh, of this before we get to the next section. Uh, I can't remember what's left in it, though. Have you frozen? Nope, you haven't frozen. Oh, you oh crap! Very, you were very still and it was very quiet. So I <laughs> so sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I I accidentally messed up right there. My bad. Here we go. Ah, okay. Um, which is not, and it, and it's still not uh, not even a, a widely held idea. I don't think on the basis of, of, of my reading of the field, um, you know that uh, that there even was uh, a very strong promotion of, of ideas like this with regards to texts like Isaiah 53. So uh, quite often um, I am I am puzzled and I am skeptical of the way in which which uh, Carrier will read the secondary literature. Oh, could you pause that right there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, okay, so late ancient. And maybe that's what he means. Uh, I just wanted to check uh, like what he's saying. Um, I mean, Boyerin literally contradicts him on that, but uh, he, he might be disagreeing I don't know. I'm trying to be too charitable and maybe I shouldn't be a charitable anymore. I'm, I'm trying to assume that maybe uh, Kip Davis is in, secretly, but not telling anyone admitting that late and late, late ancient Jews read Isaiah 52 to 53 as messianic, but earlier Jews didn't. And that's where we get to Hengel and Hengel's the one who like, you know, triangulates the evidence that shows that actually they probably did. Um, but, uh, but anyway, it's totally fine if Kip Davis says, I'm not convinced by that evidence. What's not fine for Kip Davis is to claim that it is incompetent to make that claim because massively, massively competent people have made that claim multiple times. Like, like all over the literature, I document, like I said, over a dozen uh, have made this point uh, and who are way more qualified than me and Kip Davis combined. So, so you can't make this your incompetent argument. Uh, you can make the argument that like, I just, I'm not convinced by it, but that's fine. But um, to try and turn it into this incompetence thing, that's what's bullshit. Uh, total 100% bullshit and, and is easily refuted 
by massive lists of scholars who are massive experts uh, who agree with me on this stuff. No, uh, yeah, uh, good, good point. <laughs> so lots of times I've noticed as well, he'll, he'll um, depend on what I would consider uh, outdated information. And I, I've encountered a couple of instances, one in particular I'm thinking of where carrier and, and mythicists uh, depend on a, a, a published uh, translation of a certain uh, text from the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, 4Q541. Uh, which was made before uh, 2005 on the basis of poor photographs. Um, and in more recent uh, scholarship, now, I, I mean, we now have, have available to us these very high quality digital images of all the fragments. I mean, it, it's, it's readily apparent that there are several places within this fragment that have been mistranscribed and as a result, mistranslated. Um, and they're, they're significant enough to, to affect the entire meaning of the entire text. Uh, and this is the sort of stuff that hasn't been widely published to this point. It probably should be, um, but it's the sort of thing that unless you're right within the guild and unless you know how to effectively use all the tools, you're going to be putting yourself at a disadvantage. And, and that's where I, I feel like very often uh, Richard's work will fall short because he's already at a disadvantage in his inability to, to read all the languages or to, to carefully enough navigate uh, the literature. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't doubt he's, he's doing his best, but it's, it, is, it, it remains a problem. Yeah, that's funny. That is so funny. Um, first of all, I myself, in On the Historicity of Jesus, never use 4Q541. So he's already lying to you about my, my supposedly like relying on 5Q41. I, I never use it. Uh, I don't. I don't. Uh, so that's not even in On the Historicity of Jesus. So he's off the rails there. But the really embarrassing thing that he is slagging off his own fucking dissertation advisor, George Brooke, because you know who's the leading expert on 5Q451? Fucking George Brooke. You know who wrote a book about how the uh, uh, 4Q551 attests to uh, you know, use of Isaiah 52 to 53 to imagine a dying and or, or possibly dying, he says, you know, very, very distinct possibility of dying Messiah, certainly a suffering Messiah concept. George fucking Brooke, Kip Davis's fucking dissertation advisor. Uh, this is, he did, not me. I didn't do that. I don't, I don't use 4Q5541. The other thing is, is that Kip Davis gives no examples, no evidence of his claim. He says, oh, it's been radically reinterpreted. Okay. In any relevant way? Like, has, have you told your dissertation advisor, George Brooke, about this? Like, has he, has he written a retraction? Like, what are you talking about, Kip? Like, what, do you have? Can you give us a specific example of an argument in George Brooks' treatise, which he's pub republished? Actually, Brook has published it twice. Can you give us an example of where George Brook, your own dissertation advisor, fucks up the reading of four Q five forty one, and therefore his conclusion about all of this, which is based on multiple sections of the text, it's not based on a single reading of a single thing. Can you show us an example of how he is, George Brooke, your own dissertation advisor, is wrong? Give us an example. Now, also explain why you think I'm the one making this argument. This is your dissertation advisor, George Brooke, who's making this argument. I don't rely on this text. Anyway, um, it just shows you that every fucking thing Kip Davis says is, is fucking false. Like, it's, it's he's just spinning bullshit out of nowhere. It's like, waves his hands and magic unicorns fly around. I, I, I just don't understand why he how he even thinks he's he knows what he's doing here um but certainly he's not giving the public any useful information he's giving no examples of what he's talking about uh he's misinforming the public he, like he's claiming i'm using this argument when it actually it's other scholars including his own dissertation advisor who are making this argument um he's not doing anything that's useful uh he's just trying to slag people off and that to me looks like evasive distraction behavior rather than actually engaging with the material case in point none of this has anything to do with the article that they are supposed to be talking about this is another example where they've he's just gone off on this side rant that has 15 things false and wrong about it and yet it's still not even relevant it has nothing to do with the article that there's of mine that they're supposed to be talking about in this video uh, and so here you see that happen right you see this apologetic broken epistemology this this certain methodology that they're engaging in it's rhetorical it's illogical it's counterfactual it's dishonest and and that's what they're doing and i, I you know why they're doing it i leave it up to the public to figure out 
Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I find that um, both McGrath and Kip seem to be very dishonest throughout the entire uh, interview that they did. Um, it's, it, it was, it, it, it was really hard for me to get through it, but you know, I, <laughs> I listened to it at least twice so that I could pull out. Wow. All the That's clips. uh thank you for your I'm service. <laughs> so the next part is, um, the according to, uh, Kip has, a kind yeah, of, a long argument this is about, another one that's, uh, <laughs> 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 all right. So, uh, I'll go ahead and start. At this, maybe this is a good good uh, place to, to to bring up um, a specific point, uh, which I feel uh, affects a lot of carriers' work, uh, which is which is quite troubling. And that's his idea of what this phrase even means that that Paul will use quite frequently, according to the scriptures. <laughs> and I I feel like uh, carrier and uh, well, okay, let's, will, pause, will... let's pause for a minute uh, so that we don't get distracted. Mm -hmm. Everybody, take note that he said, Kip Davis said that Paul uses according to the scriptures frequently. Now, you know, I'm very susceptible to gaslighting, apparently, because I was like, does he? I was like, I'm sure that's not true, but why would Kip Davis say that unless it was? Like, am I missing something? Did I forget something? So I literally scoured the Greek text of the New Testament. This is false. Paul never, ever uses that phrase except one time when he's quoting the Corinthian creed. And it appears multiple times in that creed, but it, it, and it's generally widely agreed in the field that Paul is quoting a creed that sort of circulated it. He didn't write the creed. So he's quoting someone else. It's not Paul. Um, <clears throat> and that's the only place, right? That he uses the phrase uh, katagraphos, which is, uh, or katatasgraphos either way, uh, which is according to the scriptures. Nowhere else in the letters of Paul, zero places does Paul use that phrase. So Kip Davis immediately misinformed the public by saying that, that Paul uses it frequently. He does not. It's not even Pauline. Like it's, it's, it's not even a Pauline phrase. Like it's in the creed, which is not written by Paul. It's just quoted by Paul. So, but it's definitely not frequently used by Paul. That's the first problem. And it gets worse from here. So let's, <laughs> Roll it. <laughs> See this phrase. They have an idea in their head of what it means right at the outset, just based on on their their uh, straightforward reading of of the text, just a plain reading of the text. And that's not I. It, that's just not good enough because it doesn't delve into a more specific understanding, a very deeply culturally informed understanding of what Paul is most likely getting at when he talks about knowing things according to the scriptures. It's a it's a phrase that is is not unique to Paul. It's something that he's inherited. It occurs um, a, a couple of times even in in uh, uh, the Old Testament, uh, in particular in the in the, the book of uh, Chronicles. Uh, the writer talks about about knowing things according to the law. Um, it's used with great frequency. Uh, this particular phrase, as well as analogous phrases to it, uh, within and and throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is really where we should be grounding ourselves in attempting to understand what Paul is trying, what he's getting at when he's using this phrase. Uh, significantly, when the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls talk about knowing things from Scripture, they're talking about the ways in which the Old Testament or or their their Hebrew scriptures uh, it came to confirm for them the the validity and the special meaning of things that actually happened. Okay, pause Stuff there. that they were going through. So there's multiple things wrong here. Um, now, he's being slippery, so he, he's not giving examples, so we don't really know what the fuck he's talking about right now. Um, but if if he's talking about the Pesher, the Pesherim, uh, that's false. The, the Pesherim are about the future, so they're always talking about like this, this, this scripture actually describes, or it, it is to be understood as referring to this thing. Um, but that is not katatas grafas. It's not according to the scriptures. That is not the phrase, right? So that phrase, I don't, so I don't know when he says the phrase is used in the Disky Scrolls. I don't know what he's talking about because that's not in the Pesherim. The Pesherim do not use that phrase. Um, if it's somewhere else, I don't know what he's referring to, like what specific example, um, if he's talking about a Greek text in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I very much doubt that he's even telling the truth. Uh, I would be shocked and surprised and amazed if there was a Greek text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that used kata tasgraphos. Uh, But anyway, uh, he doesn't give any examples, so I can't check. So I don't know, right? Like he's gaslighting us again. So I don't know if, if what he's saying is relevant or true. Um, 
So anyway, because I felt like I was being gaslighted, normally I wouldn't bother. I was pretty sure, like, I'm, this is my field. I fucking know this shit. Uh, I was pretty sure what kata tasgraphos means and based on precedence in Greek language, etc. cetera. Uh, but I checked. I, I went to the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae and I fucking checked. I searched every goddamn fucking example of kata tasgraphos or any combination thereof. Checked everything. And there's only two kinds of references like that. One is quotations of Paul. So like later writers who quote Paul, uh, you know, and Paul, obviously. Um, and other authors who use the phrase, and how do they use, how do 100% of the other authors who use the phrase, how do you think they use the phrase? To denote a source. <laughs> fucking yes. God motherfucking damn it. Uh, yeah, it's never used, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, ever used to refer to fulfillment of the scriptures. Um, now, possibly in later Christian authors who are quoting Paul and reinterpreting Paul, etc., maybe in some of that later literature, it is. I don't know. I didn't check because I didn't think that was relevant. But in terms of everything about in up to, let's say, like the third century outside Christianity uh, and uh, everything before Paul. Uh, and then therefore the way that anybody who Paul, anybody who read Paul then would understand him and the way Paul would assume people would understand him. When you look at all of that evidence, it is absolutely clear without doubt, without exception, that katatas grafas means source. It does not mean fulfillment. So that means that we learn this from the scriptures. That's what he's saying. Now, that's the argument that act completely contradicts uh, Kip Davis. It's worse than that because we have Paul himself telling us this. This is the thing that really is tough. This is an example where, because no one corrects Kip during this, so clearly no one here knows what the fuck they're talking about. It's not even James McGrath. That means none of them have read my book. Kip Davis hasn't. James McGrath, fucking liar, claimed to read it. He doesn't know it because if he had read it, he would know <clears throat> that Paul literally says we learn the gospel and charisma of Christ, of Jesus, from the scriptures. Now, I'm not, that's not a verbatim quote, but it comes from Romans 16, verses 25 to 26. You can read it. It's unmistakable that Paul is citing scripture as a source for the gospel and for the charisma. I don't know what else to fucking say. I, and I don't know how they don't know this. This is, like, this is... They complain about me being incompetent. They're massively fucking incompetent. James McGrath, who, how could he, of all fucking people, not know Romans 16, verses 25 to 26? Like, I, I can't even understand this. Okay, then there's this. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So in, in bring introduce this. So bring this up, too. This is additional. Right. So so I, I've, I've watched uh, too much of Bart Ehrman. I know that he's <laughs> talked about this before, like the names of, of the gospels that we have. And you know, it, it's the gospel according to Matthew, according to whoever. Right. Well, I, so I looked in my Jesus interrupted <laughs> because I, I have, you know, his books. Uh, but he says names are attached to the, to the titles of the gospels, the gospel according to Matthew, but these titles are later additions to the gospels provided by editors and scribes to inform readers who the editors thought were the authorities behind the different versions that the titles are not uh, original to the gospels themselves should be clear upon some simple reflection. Whoever wrote Matthew did not call it the gospel according to Matthew the persons who gave it that title are telling you in their opinion, who wrote it, which would be the source. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that's absolutely true. Uh, this is why I, this is a, a thing that gets miscommunicated in the public. There's a telephone game on this. And um, cause I often get people asking me like, is it true that the earliest manuscripts are anonymous? It's like, no, that isn't what scholars mean when they say that the Gospels were originally anonymous. All of the manuscripts we have come from the labeled edition, which was the anti-Martianite edition uh, in which someone assigned these labels. So we don't have any earlier manuscripts. So we can't even ask the question whether they said this or not. Um, no, the, the argument that scholars pervasively throughout the field agree that is the phrase kata, like kata and a name, like kata markam, which is according to Mark, the phrase itself 
is universally in Greek means source. It does not mean author uh, in, in the literal sense, right? So uh, it, in any any case, I, I for example, I found many examples in Galen. Like this, we have a lot of writings of Galen, more than we have of most other authors uh, and in, in terms of word count. And uh, Galen uses this phrase a lot, kata tas grafas or kata and a name or whatever. It's always according to as a source. He's always saying like, this is how we, we learn from this source, this, or everybody, he'll say like, uh, you know, katas tas grafas and he'll say like all. So like, it's like all, according to all the writings and others, according to everybody, everybody says this, right? So it's always a source aspect. And there are no other examples before the Gospels. There are no other examples in the entirety of ancient literature of any book ever having this title. So no one ever identified an author with kata. That That is a weird, completely unique, strange thing that only the Gospels, the, someone did to the Gospels. And the, the point that's been argued is that they were all labeled at the same time because it's clear that no one started the trend and it got picked up. Like someone just labeled them all and then published. But yeah, what they're saying is that what Bart Ehrman says here is that someone is saying, we think this is the person who wrote this, or we think this is the source behind this, even if some other scribe or whatever wrote it. Uh, and so that's what they're saying. And that's a very unique and different thing. Uh, usually if you identify authorship, it's in the genitive, or it's some sort of explicit phrase that says authored by or something like that. Um, so, so this is just, taken for granted. Like, this is what experts know. I don't know how Kip Davis does not know this. This is something, that if he's competent in this field, he should know this. Uh, but yeah, this is one other thread about how kata gets used to refer to source, not to fulfillment. Uh, now, he did. I did notice that he did reference something he said, uh, like, according to the law. He, he threw mm -hmm. a reference in there. Um, I don't know if he re realized that that's a counterexample to his argument. He's refuting himself with his own example. Um, according to the law does not mean fulfillment, right? Like, what does according to the law mean? Obeying the law, right? It means you're following the law. It doesn't mean a fulfillment of scripture. It doesn't mean a fulfillment of a prediction. It means that you're basically using that as your source for your ethics. So you say, this guy lives according to the law. You're saying that he's sourcing his behavior to the, the law, to the Bible or whatever. Uh, so that's actually a counterexample that actually refutes for Kip Davis's entire point, which just shows that he's bullshitting. He doesn't really fucking know what he's talking about. He's just rambling, basically. Um, so no, yeah, absolutely not. Everything he says is false. Paul does not use this phrase frequently at all, much less to refer to the fulfillment of the Gospels. No one does. Zero people. Uh, certainly before Paul, no one does. Um, after, like I said, maybe there's some some Christian later that you can find in a later Christian tradition who does. I don't know, but... Um, but certainly not when Paul was writing. That was not how the phrase would ever have been understood. It would always have been understood as source. Uh, we, we know from the scriptures. Uh, and, and like I said, he himself says that's what he meant in Romans uh, 16. So there's more evidence than that. I talk about it in my book, but obviously these guys have never fucking read it, so they don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we got a little bit more of this according to section. I think we pretty thoroughly covered it. Um, but we'll we'll listen a little bit more to see if they say say anything substantial. Okay. There's a series of of uh, texts. Uh, people like to call them commentaries or pesharim, uh, peshers, on the, uh, the the text of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which go through this uh, uh, th this this formulaic uh, structure of of interpreting uh, text from the prophets, where they will cite a text from, from the prophet Habakkuk, and then they'll provide a meaning to it. And they'll say this, the interpretation of this text is this, or this scripture. Stop means right there. This. It's, it's basic. That, stop right there. That's correct. What he said is like, the phrasing is more like what he just said is like, the interpretation of this is, and then they'll give an interpretation. Um, that is not contestus graphis. That is not according to the scriptures. There's no connection whatsoever. He's just telling us random facts that have nothing to do with what he was talking about before. Uh, it's important to note that like how that the shell game, like he's done a little switch on you. Like this is like Penn and Teller. He's done a little Penn and Teller act uh, where he's kind of like pretending that he's told you something that's significant, but he's switched terminology halfway through. And if you don't pay attention, you don't notice that he, he's just talking out of his ass at this point. Yeah. 
basically an expounding of this idea of it being according to the scriptures. And over and over again, throughout these texts, you come to discover that they're not just sitting down and reading literature and coming up with, with ideas uh, within their head. No, it's very important to these people that they're applying what they're seeing in the text of scripture to the very real stuff that they're experiencing in their day-to-day -day life. Stuff that's Pause there. Right. Remember what he said, like, I don't know, 15 minutes ago? <laughs> When he said, no, 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 they don't have to actually read this stuff. They're just illiterate and just listen and, and can figure that they can just figure it out. Just memorize everything and figure it out. They can just create pressure in their mind. They don't know. Here he admits that they have to actually do it textually. They have to read the fucking text to write these commentaries and construct these commentaries and find all these illusions and, and connections and stuff. Yeah, obviously they had to be fucking literate to do it. Thanks, Kip Davis, for confirming my point from earlier that you tried to deny. But anyway, <laughs> can continue. Right now, it's almost a way of history writing. Like the, the, these people. Are also, maybe I'm misunderstanding what Kip is saying here, but I feel like what he's saying is that, you know, the Jews that were doing this, they couldn't come up with novel ideas. I. Like I don't I don't know. If oh, I, I didn't take that. It. No, I I didn't okay. take that idea. If I don't think he meant that. If if he said something like that. Um, okay. I think. Yeah, I'm not going to try and interpret that. But uh, I think I mean I'm hearing it because I'm I already know how the Pesherim work. So mm -hmm. and I'm assuming maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I shouldn't do this. But I'm assuming he knows what he's talking about when it comes to the Pesherim. And so I'm assuming that when he says things that agree with things that I already know about how the Pesherim work. That that's what he means, right? And so, um, what he's talking about is that uh, they, they they would look at the scriptures and they would come up with actually quite creative ways to understand the scriptures. I think he would agree if you ever asked him. Um, completely radically creative ways to under understand the scriptures. Um, but what he's trying to argue is he's trying he's he's was originally trying to argue that katatas graphas meant something. But he's completely gone off the rails, and he's talking about a completely different phrase that, that has no relevance or similarity to Cotta Scrophus. He's talking about the phrase in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the that the interpretation is as follows. And, and in that context, yeah, absolutely, what he's describing is correct, that they would read a text, and they say the interpretation of this is that, and it'd be like, you know, this text says there was a lion sitting on a hill, and is, the interpretation of that is that there was a particular... Like, Antiochus, who is known as the lion, is therefore uh, in charge of something. Like I'm not, I'm making that up, but I'm just saying, like they, they would completely reinterpret what the text meant, uh, and and that's what they're doing. And they're using, they use a very uh, a fixed phrase, a very commonly used phrase, which is something like the interpretation is, and and that's how they do it. But that that is not katatas graphis. That that katatas graphis is according to. And according to only means uh, uh, only means source in Greek or uh, obedience, adherence. So like according to the law means you're following the law. Um, th those are the only two meanings that are relevant to texts. Uh, and and so for him to, he's, he's somehow like, he's trying to shell game us into thinking that a completely different phrase in Hebrew in the Dead Sea Scrolls informs us about a, a completely radically different phrase in Greek as if he knows Greek uh, well, and clearly he doesn't because he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about with Cotinus Graphus. He didn't check, clearly. This is another thing. He didn't fucking check. The whole article is about how it falls apart when you don't check. And here are these guys doing this shit, spewing bullshit, and they're not checking. And they're therefore they're verifying exactly the point of my article is that this is what happens when you don't check is that you spew these like wildly false, uh, you know, lines of bullshit that have nothing to do with reality. Uh, and you know what happens when you check it, it, you get a completely different result than this. That's the point of my article. And they're just verifying it over and over again in this video. Um, now there, there is still a little bit left in this section, but uh, I know we, we do need to go soon. Uh, okay. But the, the, the next section is the list of scholars, the, the griping over mm. the scholars. Yeah. Uh, would, would you want to address that before we head out? Um I mean, do I don't know. Do you have any particular section? thoughts on it? Because I, I can just like wave it away with a single point, which is that they, they have misunderstood it in the video as if I was presenting this list of scholars who agree that mythicism is plausible as if that was an argument from authority that therefore you should agree 
mythicism is plausible because the, this number of scholars, and, and that's not how I've ever used the list. The list itself explicitly explains what the list is for. And if people who've been watching this all this time are still staying with us, um, I mentioned earlier, I quoted Bart Ehrman saying, not a single scholar anywhere, sitting anywhere, and any professor anywhere. Like, Ehrman said that. No one, fucking zero people. And so like, okay, motherfucker, you're gaslighting us all fucking again. You're making me do this. I'm going to list the people that fucking refute that argument. <laughs> so it's, it's the historicists who made this argument, not fucking me. It's Bart yeah. Ehrman who made the argument that no one, no one, fucking no one thinks takes this seriously. So, okay, so I'm going to list people who take it seriously. I listed over 40 now. How many fucking people do you need until you would admit that what you said is fucking false? That's that's the thing that pisses me off. Like, do I need a hundred thousand? Like, fucking how many do I need? And anyway, that that's how this list was generated. And and their whole bit, they spend like 20 minutes on the list complaining about it. Uh, and it's all off the rails because they don't understand the actual rhetorical context in which the list exists or what it's meant to point, what it's meant to prove. All it's meant to do is refute bullshit arguments like Bart Ehrman's. It has no other function. And and I think if once we make that point, we don't really have to listen to them rant on and on about their, the bullshit complaints they have about the list because they've completely misrepresented what the list is for. They've invented a new version of history in which the argument Bart Ehrman made doesn't exist, and therefore there's no reason for me to have the list. Uh, and, and then they make a bunch of other stupid arguments about why I don't have them on the list. And the reason I don't is because they're not sincere. Uh, it, you know, Kip Davis claims in the clip that, well, I just told him not to put me on the list. It's like, no, the reason I don't have him on the list is because he I don't believe him when he says uh, that he thinks mythicism is plausible. I think he's fucking lying. And and it, this video shows that him repeatedly basically taking the position that it is ridiculous and impossible and, and shouldn't be taken seriously. It, and then he'll lie in another 50 minutes about like, oh, yeah, yeah, it should be taken seriously. And then he'll go back to like ridiculing and saying it's incompetent and stuff like that. So I, I don't think that he's at all sincere. And so I'm not going to put someone who's not sincere on the list. And then they make some other points about uh, how I supposedly misread the text um, the, the authors, those are cases where you can go yourself and go read the authors and they've completely gotten them wrong. Uh, and, and they've just, they've read into the text things that they want to hear. Whereas I'm reading the text, I'm listening to what the scholar actually had to say. And so that, that those are things where people can fact check them themselves. Don't trust these guys. They're, they're not going to give you an accurate uh, representation of things. And I think that's enough. I don't think we need to like listen to them rant on, but anyone who does want to, you can go like the video. I assume the link is in your description uh well yeah so well uh so i don't have the link to the the list of scholars but i'll, I'll get that no, no i mean i mean the video that we're critically oh yes out. yes yeah, the yeah. video so, that yeah yeah so people can go and look at it and you can fact check everything they claim I, what i'm just telling you is don't trust them don't just believe them on face value like anything they say fucking check it before you believe them uh is, is and, and that applies to like everything they say about my list uh, of scholars yeah, I know that potential theists had a really big uh, sort of problem with Burton Mack being on the list because apparently, yeah, he, he just doesn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I don't want to like burn clock on that. It seems silly. I, I do. I could bring up. I have the whole book. Like I could bring it up and stuff. Uh, no, he he's reading Mack out of context. He's not paying attention to the context in which Mack is saying the comments that I'm referring to. Uh, and because he's ignoring the context, he's he's quote mining. This is another example of quote mining. Uh, but anyone who actually reads the text of Mac knows that Mac's whole point throughout the entire thing of the myth of of, of it basically says you know the, the myth of innocence is his is the article. The whole point is that scholars are not are on the wrong track. They're not paying attention to this other literature. Uh, and so he has this footnote about here's an example of the literature that they're not paying attention to. Uh, and he lists mythicist literature in, in there. <clears throat> and so the point is like, like he's, he's saying like, you guys need to pay more attention to this. He's not saying that it's correct. He's not saying like, he's a mythicist or anything like that. He's just saying like, th this is an example of the shit we're ignoring that we shouldn't be ignoring. And that's the whole point of myth of innocence. And, and I even like, I have like a re book review by a major scholar of this book where he, he correctly understands what Max said. And has all paragraph on it. Um, so I know I'm not 
you know, and it's the thing is I feel like I'm being fucking gaslighted. So I had I had to check, like, am I the only person who's reading Mac this way? No, no, no. Everybody's reading Mac this way, except these people uh, in this video. They're the only ones who aren't reading Mac, aren't listening to what Mac actually said in context. And, and that's the kind of thing that is enraging. And I do lose my patience with it. Well, so I, I kind of see, uh, you know, like you had kind of said before, when it happens over and over again, it becomes a trend. Yeah, this definitely seems to be a trend of like whenever we find a a, an, a scholar that you know backs up one of the points that you make, um, you know whether that be the uh, suffering or dying Messiah, or I know you just recently posted on your Facebook about how yet another. Uh, major publication uh, affirmed one of the, one of your elements in yeah. in the book. Yeah, um, multiple. Actually, there, there have been multiple peer reviewed studies confirming the right. same element. It, it's the, it's a different element than we're talking about today. But yeah, it's on yeah. my Facebook wall for people who want to talk about it. Yeah, and so it it seems like every time that happens, uh, the excuse given by uh, historicists or people pushing back against us is that oh, well you just can't read the words on the page or something to that effect. Like you just don't understand what he's saying. Yeah. And then invent it for, as far as I understand it, like reading the words on the page, because I do double, like I go and I follow your site. You check. That's that. the thing is you actually yeah. check. I know. Yeah. Uh, no. And, and that it's makes like, your work more quality. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, but it's like, I'm sitting here reading the words on the page and I'm, I'm thinking about what they're saying. And it's like, what the fuck like excuse my literacy on this issue but i can read it's, english and i'm reading in english it's gaslighting it's it's fucking yeah. gaslighting it's intellectual academic gaslighting uh and it's reprehensible um i i just don't know what else to make of it yeah uh, it, it, and it's uh, honestly uh, uh uh incredibly sad in my opinion that you have somebody like you know kip davis uh, you know, who's f just like with Bart Ehrman and, and plenty of other, you know, historicists, they're great in other areas, but in this one particular area, it just seems like the, I don't know what happens to them. It's like they have blinders on when it comes to, in this case, reading the fucking words that are on the page. And it's just, it's, it's so baffling to me. Um, but we do have a few, uh, a few yeah, super chats to yeah. get to, um, uh, carrier. I just, I want to thank you for s spending such a late night here with me. Um, I really I'm having a good time. It's time. good. So yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate you having me on and giving me this opportunity to address these things. So it's all good. Yeah. Well, like this was about half of the things that we meant to address, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good, it was a good, ex uh, it was a good example of them so that when when i think when people like if someone watches the video now you have some examples of the kinds of things that are going on so now you know to look for those kinds of things elsewhere in the videos like you don't have a, you don't need us to do a complete fisk of the video because you now you've been equipped you know what to look for and how to check these things and why it's important to check that was the whole point of the article that they're supposed to be talking about is it's really crucial to check and not just trust uh, and when you check, things turn out differently. And and that's that's the lesson of the article, and that's the lesson of this video, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, all right, so first up on the Super Chats, we've got more, the Morning Star, who says, I asked Dr. Ehrman if it was possible the story of the crucifixion was a literary device because it mimics Yom Kippur, and he said that the authors probably made up the story, but the crucifixion actually happened. I was baffled. <laughs> I, you know, I'll be charitable and I, I understand Bart Ehrman's argument. Uh, mm -hmm. It is totally consistent. It is coherent to take the position that not a single thing in the gospel accounts of the crucifixion are true. And yet at the same time, Jesus was crucified. Total, totally plausible. Uh, and, and in fact, likely, I think if Jesus existed, that is absolutely what has to be the case is that his actual crucifixion can't at all be anything like what the gospels describe either for the reason, either for the date of it, either for the procedures, like everything's wrong. Uh, and so, um, so that's, a, that's a credible position to take. And I understand, like, I know Ehrman himself would list a bunch of other 
like his argument would be that the crucifixion by itself, not the stories, but the crucifixion by itself is multiply independently attested. That's what he would say. Well, that's a plausible so argument. Would... I mean, it, it is technically false, but that it is false is a debatable point. And so I think that would be the, because I think, you know, you just get it in Paul and the gospels are just basing it on Paul. Right? So, uh, and, and Paul's just getting it from someone else right before him. And he claims he gets it from scripture. And therefore he's actually claiming out that he gets it from scripture, but the people before him got it from scripture. Uh, so the, the source situation for the crucifixion is way more hosed than Bart Ehrman will let on. But at least the position that he's taking is mainstream in the sense that it, it's credible at surface, right? It's not ridiculous for, for Bart Ehrman to take that position. It's false, but it's not ridiculous. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I was going to say the the argument that, that at least uh, Bart um, repeated to me was, of course, the independent sources, but also that um, just nobody would have made up a crucified messiah. Uh, and I find that to be right. the weakest and he does, right. that he makes. Which is, yeah, it's easy to refute that. Um, mm -hmm. Dozens of scholars have refuted that already. So, <clears throat> to, to which, of course, he was like, well, can you prove that they, that they did make it up? And I'm like, I'm not even trying to make that argument, Bart, but okay. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, let's see. Next uh, one, paleoism, who says, uh, how do you correctly, statistically, weigh cr weigh Christians versus non-Christian scholars when saying something like the majority of scholars believe X? Um, that's a complicated question. Uh, let me hold on. I'm I'm putting something in the chat for. Christian Michael, who put something earlier on that we skipped past um, <clears throat> for people who are interested. Uh, hopefully that'll come through. I don't know if that, if that works. Oh I yeah. I do I have normally, a highlight. I do have normally. a highlight show if we have time, but I was going to get through the super chats. Yeah. First. I just threw up a, a <clears throat> there's an article where I literally go into every aspect of that um, because that, that's an argument that's been attempted by completely incompetent people like uh O'Neill, <laughs> Tim O'Neill, who doesn't know the fuck he's talking about. Uh, and and I actually, it's one of those cases where I felt gaslighted. And so I over-researched the fucking thing. And, and anyway, I report on my research on that. Uh, and it gets the result that I knew was correct all along. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this particular question, uh, we do lack any useful tool for this. So um, by, by example, in uh, there's a thing called Phil Papers uh, Phil Papers Survey, which is a philosophy papers survey that has a polling system for philosophers, and it's pretty good. Like it's it, it polls like hundreds, if not thousands, of philosophers. And these are like PhD holding uh, philosophers, and um, you can go and look at like how many think this, how many think that, how many think this other thing, and so on. You actually have statistics, and it's pretty good. Like it's fairly reliable. I think it's you know pretty accurate to the, what the field is. Um, we don't have anything like that for biblical studies, um, partly because I think no one wants to fund it because it's expensive. Uh, and then partly also because no one wants to see what the results would be because <laughs> it, would, it would be good for anybody. Anybody who would want to fund it doesn't want to know what the results are. So uh, in, in biblical studies, because I think uh, a lot of the answers were not going to go the way of the people who would be enthusiastic for the results. Um, especially since you could start doing correlations. So you could have people answer the question, like, how Christian are you? And then you could correlate, well, the Christians answered this way and the atheists answered this way. In biblical studies, that would be like massively undiplomatic and destructive and people would freak out uh, at the results once you started actually doing things like that. And you hinted at that earlier at the top of the video when you like quoted uh, Hector Avalos, it's a similar problem right is that like no one really wants to know these things uh and it's better to like leave them obscure uh and i'm doing something similar on this so uh i'm composing an article it'll either be for in a peer-reviewed journal or for my next peer-reviewed book I haven't decided which but i'm doing a thing on uh first corinthians no, i'm sorry first thessalonians 2 which has the the interpolation on how the jews kill jesus and they're, they're usually, and this is what happens in this is the wall. Everybody says, or the majority of scholars think it's authentic or whatever. You'll see that happen a lot. And it's like, but they don't cite anybody. They don't count. They don't do any count. 
so like, how do you know? How do you know that? Right? Like, how, what do you mean? Do you, do you really just mean that the last article you read was for it and therefore you're concluding that most people think it is it, they're for it, right? Is that really what's happening? And I think that is actually what's usually happening is that uh, they're, they're only reading the authors that they want to read. And then this, well, there's a lot of them. So, or they're counting articles, which is a bad way to count opinions um, because false opinions actually get more articles written about in defense of them than true ones because true opinions, you only need one right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Like only false claims require multiple attempts to prove them. Uh, that's not true. Like there, there are many that I'm exaggerating, but anyway, the point being is you can't just count articles and, uh, uh, and do it that way. So, so no, it's hard to say. Uh, the only, what usually, like if you're being honest and objective and you say this, usually what you're doing is like, I've read like multiple commentaries. I've read multiple studies by people who are experts on this. And I know who all the leading experts on this, and I've read all of them. And based on all of that, people who know what they're talking about, most of them, if not all of them, say this X, Y, Z. Uh, and that's a reasonable position. That's reasonable to state. It, it is not itself a proof of the conclusion. It is just something worth pointing out. Uh, so I don't think it's ridiculous to point that out. Uh, I just think if you're leaning on that, if that's your argument, like, like you mic drop after that, like, okay, now, now you've, you've lost the narrative and you, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you, you're trying to game the argument rather than actually make an argument. Um, mm -hmm. What you need to do is you have to say like, yeah, most scholars think this, here is why, right? And then you, then you give the evidence like what, what is convincing these guys? Um, and let's assume you do that honestly. Uh, you know, it's not bullshitting. Assume you do it honestly. And then someone, you look at it and objectively, the reasons are bullshit. Like they're terrible. It's like, okay, so most people believe this for really bad reasons. Like you're not selling it. <laughs> right. Uh, and so that's what you have to do. Like, that's how you have to take these arguments. So first is if someone says most scholars say, do they just say that or do they give evidence of that? Like, do they cite some scholars? Um, and, and I'll often do that. Like, I'll, I'll just say like most scholars say this and I don't cite anybody. So like, yeah, you can totally call me out on that. Like, I don't, you know, like I I'm telling you what my impression is from looking at the field. I could be wrong. Uh, and, but I'm not going to lean on that. I'll never just say that's, that's it. Mic drop. Like, that's not how it goes. It's like, if I know most scholars have said a thing, I'll also, and if I think that's relevant, then I'll also either know why they're right. Um, uh, or it's something outside my field where all I can go on is what the experts are saying. And I'm just telling you that's the, that's as far as I can go on the evidence. Um, and so that's, that's how I use it. So yeah. I think well, what one has to do is look for. I don't know, uh, legitimate versus illegitimate uses of that phrase. Uh, and it's not straightforward. Um, like I said, there's no simple answer to this question. It's complicated. Well, how would you, how would you make a determination if a, if a position is, is mainstream? Like if, if we were to say, Oh, well, yeah. this is a mainstream position. Yeah. So when I use when myself, uh, use the word mainstream, I mean, not fundamentalist. So, um, so not Christian apologetics, but, but scholars who are actually committed to being objective. Uh, and I'll give examples like um, Raymond Brown, who's you know deceased now, but he's a good example of someone who was both an objective scholar and a Christian apologist. And he actually demarcated them. So like, for instance, when he talks about the nativity of Jesus, he'll say from a perspective of, of objective history, it's a myth, but I believe it anyway on faith. Right. So like, that's something like he would say, like using the tools of history, this is mythological, it's made up, it's, you know, but, but I still believe it and here's why. So that was a very honest way of approaching things like that. Uh, and, and that I would call mainstream. That's a mainstream way of approaching it. Um, Non-mainstream is the fundamentalist route, which is where you're just, you're trying to defend the faith. You're, and whether you're doing that honestly and saying like, yeah, I'm just trying to defend the faith or whether you're pretending like James McGrath that you're not defending the faith, that you're just being an objective scholar, but really secretly you're defending the faith, right? Like <laughs> that, that's not mainstream anymore. That that's you're you're really starting to, you're getting to the Christian apologetics. And yeah, it, because it's disingenuous and masking, it's hard to tell sometimes which is which and that can be tricky. So generally what I look for is a, if I look for scholars and you can litmus test them and say, like, what positions are they taking generally that don't align with what Christian apologists would be all for? 
and say like, okay, that person is probably mainstream because they've clearly, they're going where the evidence leads, not where their dogma needs them to go. Uh, and that's how you tell the difference between mainstream and non-mainstream. But generally it means secular and objective scholars uh, that can include Christian scholars, but it, it means scholars who are acting like Raymond Brown, who aren't engaging in apologetics, whether they're honest or dishonest about it. Um, and, and again, like it requires my acumen at my level to figure that out and read a lot of things. And, uh, so it's, it's hard to give a concrete proof of, of a conclusion like that. I, I can just give you my opinion based on what I know. And I can also tell you if I don't know, uh, that that's the thing I feel committed to do. Like if I'm not sure what's mainstream, uh, I'll say, I, I don't, I'm not sure it's mainstream. Um, and uh, before we move on to the next one, I just thought that you might find it funny that um, in Bart Ehrman's seven hour debate with Mike Lacona, the question was asked was, about was it a seven hour debate or was it like multiple it was, episodes? No, no, no. I mean, it was one day, seven hours. They took breaks in between. Wow. The different segments. No, I didn't know yeah. about this. OK, interesting. When did this happen? Yeah, uh, it was last year. Oh, wow. Um, OK, no, I didn't know remember. about this, but all right. Yeah, yeah. He so in in the debate, uh, Lycona, it, the the question was, where do you see yourself in the majority position? Like, are you in the majority? Or is your position in the majority on the resurrection? Like, is your position in the majority or the minority? And so Mike Lacona actually said, there, "There's I've got sound bites of this." Mike Lacona actually said that he was he finds himself in the minority of scholars. In, in the field of New Testament studies that take the resurrection as being a historical fact. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And of yeah, course, I, Bart, know, I'm not surprised by this because Lacona tends to be an honest scholar. Like uh, he's, he's one of those, uh, he's not like William Lane Craig. Like he's someone I actually think is sincere and honest most of the time. Uh, and I, I can't even think of a specific example of him being ever being dishonest. So um, th that's an example of someone doing that. That's, that's Raymond Browning, uh the the conversation which which is always refreshing I, I like seeing that but it does remind me uh in response to paleoism um i i always look for at least three people that i i am confident are mainstream and not not apologists um if i can find and, and you're fully qualified etc if, if at least three people fairly recently like within the last 10 or 20 years take a position then i consider the position mainstream um whether I would say like the majority of scholars say something that requires a lot more than three uh, to, to come to, to cut, to say something like that. Uh, and then, you know, a majority of mainstream scholars say X or most mainstream scholars say X that requires more than three, but, uh, but there are a lot of positions that are held by a lot of scholars that are not, you know, the majority position, but are respected by the majority. Uh, a good example is the zealot hypothesis of Jesus, right? So, um, Reza Aslan took a lot of shit for this because he's kind of a hack, but there, it's actually a serious position in the field. So like uh, there are real scholars who are not hacks uh, like Fernando Bermejo Rubio is a good example of someone who's he wouldn't call it the zealot hypothesis. He hates the word zealot, but uh, he, he thinks that Jesus was an actual militant advocating war and that he got after he got killed, he got whitewashed as a pacifist. That's his theory. Uh, now, this is a fringe theory. Very few scholars think that this is credible, but, uh, or very few scholars think it's true. Let me make that point. Um, but a lot of scholars, like most people I talk to, most people I read, will admit that it's at least plausible. Like it, they'll take it seriously. We'll take, we think it's false, but we'll, it's a serious position to, to hold. Uh, and I find that from people I interact with who are actual scholars in the field, and I get the impression from them, and then people I read and stuff. Um, and, and that's how I get that impression of, even though it's fringe, it's still accepted as, as uh, mainstream in the sense that it's a plausible, contendable position. Uh, I don't know if that helps answer the question, but I thought that would, I would add that. Okay. Yeah. You, you might like to know that in that debate, um, Bart Ehrman also said that he was in the minority position on the resurrection. Um, <laughs> Meaning he thinks most scholars are religious believers who believe in the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up is Q source who says, surely based off their confidence here, there must be a recent monograph demonstrating Jesus probably existed, right? <laughs> I wish <laughs> that would be great evidence. <laughs> I'm, I'm calling for it. I'm trying to get someone to do it, but uh, no one's doing it. What can I do? 
Uh, and then Potential Theism's been watching, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> potential, potential Theism says, despite our disagreements, thanks for doing this stream. Uh, I appreciate you being in the chat uh, there, Potential. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Margaret Delvedin just sent a super sticker that was uh, an awesome one. So thank you so much for the uh, support there, Margaret. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Awesome. And then uh, Rambo Krampus is like tired of all the salt in the chat. So let's talk fun across a, uh, across a thousand dead worlds is a great space horror TTRPG. I just found highly recommend if you're looking to run something that isn't D &D. across a thousand dead worlds. I'm intrigued already. Um, so I won't remember that. So uh, Rainbow Krampus. Um, Let's see. What do I say? So uh, remember this. Type type this. You got to email me. And so if you don't know my email address, I'm going to give it out. I mean, it's public. It's, this isn't like secret. Uh, is richard.carrier at icloud.com. Uh, you can find that on, you know, there's a contact page you can find on my website if you're smart enough to navigate. Uh, but um, anyway, that's my email address. Email that to me because I, I am interested, actually. I have a huge collection of tabletop role-playing games uh going all the way back to a 1980 release of doctor who tabletop role-playing game so i've got a lot of stuff and i'm particularly interested in space opera things so that sounds right up my alley so definitely send me that i would appreciate it uh awesome okay and then finally i normally only do super chats but this was a pretty good question at the beginning uh christian michael says in the video dr carrier will respond to to Kip Davis brings up something that I also see with Genomai. Carrier imagines that he knows without careful study how an idiom is used by an author. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't, uh, so first of all, I don't know if this person is still hanging out because we did go a long time. Um, in the in the chat, I did, it's probably buried now in under a million comments, but I did put something up there. Um, Let's see, what, what is the article? If you're looking for it, uh, oh, yeah, it, the article title is, and you can find this on my blog, A Primer on Successful versus Bogus Methodology, colon, Tim O'Neill edition. Um, and that's an article where Tim O'Neill pulled this argument. Like, he says, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. It's just an idiom. Uh, and I said, okay, let me school you on how idioms work. <laughs> how the Greek language works, what's actually going on here, why we think what we think, and so on. Uh, and so, and, and that's another one where I felt gas, gaslit, and so I actually did way more work than I needed to do, checking the thesaurus lingua right guy, for examples, and so on. Um, and, and I get some very amusing results, so it's actually a fun article to read. Like, if you like serious gotcha articles, it's a it's a good one. It's a, a nail-biter. Uh, but... Um, <laughs> Anyway, it answers this question of, of what do we, when we, we talk about the different meanings of genomai in context versus genao, these are two Greek words that mean nearly the same thing, but not exactly. Um, how do we tell the difference between the use of an idiom versus the adaptation and modification of an idiom? Uh, and to do that, I, I go into that in there. So with examples and stuff. So I think even people who can't read Greek can follow what I'm talking about in there. Um, and it's, it's a useful education of, how we do what we do like that by that i mean ancient historians who work in greek and latin classics um so uh so that, anyway that that's the answer to the question I, I don't think there's any need to go into it more here because that's all there yeah uh, uh and uh, i'm glad that you put that uh in the chat there but uh anyways uh that's gonna be it for our stream tonight thank you so much dr carrier for stopping yeah. by and yeah, yeah. Uh, going through thanks all for this hanging out for so long yeah <laughs> No, no, I, this, no. this was good. It was fruitful. We covered a lot of subjects, uh, and I think everything's pretty solid. So, um, yeah, touche. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, everybody, uh, we do have a live stream this weekend, and we've got a new video coming out tomorrow uh, about Frank Turek and his four reasons that we should think Christianity is true. So uh, I will see you heathens tomorrow. Y'all have an awesome night, and don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.